Okay. Calling the Petaluma City Schools, December 13th, Board of Education meeting to order at 5.03. We're gonna start by acknowledging AB 361. We are still in the hybrid format. We're gonna start with comments from the public on closed session items. If there is anyone in the public that has a comment, the chat is open. Please put your first and last name in the chat and what you would like to speak about. Okay, so we are going to adjourn to closed session. Okay. Calling the December 13th Board of Education meeting back into order at 6.03. Thank you all for being here. It's so nice to see you guys. We are going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Right? Oh, where's the flag? <laughs> Is it going to be like, you know, Amy, are you going to like put it up on the screen? Okay. <laughs> I didn't even notice. Is going to hold it? All right. Chris with the colors. <laughs> and the stand is still in there, so I'll just Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Maybe we should salute you or something. <laughs> Do you want to take it back? Yeah. There's always something, right? <laughs> These meetings. Okay. Okay. Um, comments from the public on non agendized items. If there is anyone in person or online that would like to comment about something that is not on the agenda, this feels out of place. No, it feels like it, but it's on there. Okay. Um, that is not on the agenda. Um, if you are in person and have a comment, you can come up to the front. If you are online, we're gonna open up the chat and please put your first and last name in the chat. If you have a comment about something that is not on the agenda. Okay, while the chat's open, I'm gonna read our public comment policy. Under government code section 54954.3a, members of the public have the right to address the governing board on any items of interest, providing it relates to the subject matter jurisdiction of the school district. While government code allows speakers to criticize the district's policies, procedures, program services, and or employees, the district does have a policy specific to complaints against employees. Should comments from the public pertain to a specific district employee, the board requests that the complaint first be submitted in writing to the employee's immediate supervisor for investigation. If the comment is about something that is not on the agenda, it will be heard only during the public comment on non-agendized items period. Once that part of the meeting is over, comments will only be taken on agenda items during the discussion of those items. The board values public comments, and although we cannot take action or discuss items not on the agenda, we listen carefully and appreciate input from the public. Public comments are subject to a four minute per person limit or 20 minute limit per subject matter. So do we have any comments in person? No. Do we have any online? Okay. All right. Moving on There's to- There's one comment online. Oh, I didn't see it. Oh. And so I just, I just promoted or gave Natasha the permission to talk. Okay. So um, go ahead, Natasha. Oh, 
Let me try that again, Natasha. I'm clicking allow to talk, but it doesn't seem to be going through. Natasha did write into the into the, um, the chat what they wanted to say. Do you want to read that, Matthew? I can't see. It. I I can read it if you can want. You read it, Dave, please. Uh, Natasha Custodio wrote, my question is especially geared towards students who are in junior high. What is PCS doing or planning on doing to help students who are struggling to catch up due to loosing development learning skills while in distance learning and hybrid learning? Can there be opportunities for after school clinics or workshops to help these students learn the skills necessary to have a better foundation to be successful? Many students are lost and as a result are checking out in the classroom. Is that the end of it, Dave? Yeah, that's the end. Okay. All right. Are there any other comments online? Oh, Amy Carter. All right. <laughs> this is our new county superintendent elect. <laughs> Amy Carter, she said uh, it is to be the county superintendent of schools, but I couldn't miss this opportunity to come uh, acknowledge the great achievement of uh, Joanna being recognized as such a tremendous uh, board member, really exemplary in the state of California. And I know I've said this to many of you, but uh, the Petaluma City School Board is just doing incredible work. Uh, you've got a tremendous leader, a great staff. Uh, and I really think that you're becoming, you know, one of the leaders in our county. And I just want to express my gratitude, especially tonight as you bring forward your collaboration with SSU. Uh, what a great model for our students. You know, I'm so proud of my own children's Petaluma City Schools high school diploma. Uh, and that gives other students that are going to receive those opportunities to have the access to those incredible four-year institution is just really something special. So great praise for the work you're doing and just an honor to be here to watch this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is an honor to have you here, Amy. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments before we move on? Okay. Um, adoption and approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion? I move to approve the agenda. I'll second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Next up, oath of office of board members. So it is my, my privilege here. So for those of you who don't know, we had three of our board members. We recently went through a um, redistricting for our district. So we moved from um, where all five board members used to be elected at large to now we're in five different um, districts. And I'll actually, what, ha what happened to all five of our board members are actually in different districts. We had three, um, three of our board members were up for re-election this term. And um, all three of them decided to run again. We, I did not scare them away. <laughs> and they all ran unopposed. And so we're going to, um, we're going to, we actually, they, so we didn't, they didn't go on the ballot and you didn't see them on the ballot because we were, they were all unopposed. So I'm going to ask them to come up. We'll do um, one at a time. If we can have, when we start with Caitlin, the alphabetical order here, <laughs> Caitlin, come on up. So we're going to redo their oath of office and we'll have you sign your, re-sign re your oath of office. So you want to do it over, over yeah. here maybe? And I'm going to need to be here so I can read this. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, Ms. Quinn. So please, yeah, please raise your please raise your hand. So under government section 1360 and article 20 of the state constitution, by the power vested in me from the state of California and the full PCS Board of Education, please repeat after me. I, Caitlin Quinn, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation 
or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations, board member Quinn. If we could have uh, Joanna Pond, uh, come on up. Okay, Ms. Pond, under government section 1360 in article 20 of the state constitution, by the power vested in me from the state of California and the full PCS Board of Education, please repeat after me. I, Joanna Pond, do solemnly, swear do solemnly swear that I will support and defend, support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, against all enemies foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic that, I will bear true faith that I will bear true faith and allegiance, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, the of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, the of the State of California that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations, board member Pond. And last but not least, if we could have Maddie Cloud, come on up. Okay, Maddie Cloud, under government section 1316, article 20 of the state, uh, state constitution, by the power vested in me from the state of California, the full PCS Board of Education, please repeat after me. I, Maddie Cloud, I, Maddie Cloud do, solemnly swear do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies against all enemies, foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution, Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully and I will well and faithfully discharge the duties, discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations, board member Cloud. <laughs> okay, we have uh, our full full board seated, all five members. All right. A little bit more business, please bear with us, everyone. Um, nomination and election of board officers. I move to nominate, I love to nominate her for everything. Joanna Pond for president of the Petaluma City School Board of Education. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Do you accept? <laughs> yes. Oh, I accept. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you for trusting me for another year. Um, and Board Clerk, Vice President, I would like to nominate, I'll return the favor, Caitlin Quinn for the position of Board Clerk and Vice President, if she accepts. I second. I'll accept. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Congratulations, Vice Aye. President Aye. Quinn. <laughs> all right, appointment of the superintendent to secretary. I move to <laughs> nominate Superintendent Harris as secretary. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, no post. <laughs> I don't think we had a choice. Um, selection of representatives. My, my official title oh, is actually, my official title is actually yes. secretary 
of the board. Okay, okay. Yeah. well, now it's official. All right, selection of representatives and alternative representatives to fill vacancies on the Sonoma County Committee on School District Organization. Um, I am going to nominate Maddie Cloud. I second. Do you accept? Yes. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, board meeting dates. So the, the meeting dates are attached to the agenda. Okay. Um, they're essentially for the rest of this year. Do you want, we, if you want to go through them? No, it's okay. Yeah. I think we've seen these. We've seen so. them. They're the dates that are, should, should be calendared. In February, at some point in February, we will um, review dates for the following, for 22, for 23, 24. And for those of you who don't have the agenda in front of you, um, there's also listed here on March 21st, a special board meeting to discuss our equity work. So hopefully you guys put that on your calendars and our student board members and as many people will attend as possible. It's super important to us. So, all right, can we get a motion for this? There's no action. Oh, there's not? No, there's no okay. action. Okay, well, never mind then. All right, moving on. Um, is there a public hearing? No, no public hearing, okay. I'm sure this is what y'all all came for. So we're moving on to special recognitions, reports, and presentations. We're going to start with the College Promise presentation. We're sending an MOU with Sonoma State today. So, Again, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I just wanted to give a little background, in, and I want to thank um, our partners, Sonoma State, for being here this evening. I'd like to just do a, a quick, a few quick introductions. I want to introduce um, Sonoma State's president, Dr. Mike Lee, is here in attendance with us. If you could stand up, uh, Dr. Lee. Dr. Kieran Moransky, the, uh, the Sonoma State Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs is also here with us this evening. And Dr. Elias Lopez, the Senior Associate Vice President for St Strategic Enrollment is here with us this evening. So I'm just gonna introduce this um, briefly to everyone. So um, Matthew Harris, Superintendent, I, I grew up in, a small town in Michigan, Kalamazoo, Michigan. And in Kalamazoo, Michigan, they have what's known as the Kalamazoo Promise. And the Kalamazoo Promise essentially is if you go to a um, Kalamazoo City Schools, there's a promise with a, a, a private, actually supposed to be anonymous donor um, in Kalamazoo and the local university that if you meet certain requirements, you have automatic, you can automatically go to the local university and, and receive quite an, a substantial scholarship as well. Um, so that's, that's always been sort of in the back of my mind. And when I, when I came to Petaluma 11 years ago, how, what, what could that look like for Petaluma? Had some great conversations with um, Dr. Sheldon Jen, who's our trustee here on, on the board and is also a, a professor at Sonoma, at uh, Sonoma State, San Francisco State University. And um, San Francisco Unified School District has, an, has an, a partnership with um, San Francisco State. So I did a little research. I reached out to the, to the superintendent in um, San Francisco Unified and spoke with him for a while, shared the idea, some of the ideas that we've been bouncing around the entire board and I. And um, it was interesting talking, talking with um, the superintendent down in San Francisco. It was a uh, little bit different than what I had en envisioned. So... Um, Assistant Superintendent Tony Hua, um, who's sitting right, sitting right here, he and I had long conversations as well, and we decided let's let's walk, let's go over to Sonoma State, let's set up an, a meeting with with the President Lee, and just see what he thinks, see if it's even an option. And so we started it. We started the conversation, and um, Dr. Lee was so um, so hospitable and agreeable to the the idea. And so the idea is this. It's sort of the, the first of its kind of an agreement between Sonoma State and any school district here in Sonoma County. So we still have a lot of details to work through, but sort of the, the vision piece is this. Um, the vision is in the near future, we want, I want, we all want students who graduate from Petaluma City Schools with some minimum, requ minimum um, graduation requirements. That when they graduate from, a Petal from Petaluma City Schools, that they they don't need to apply to go to, to Sonoma State. We are what we're saying is 
Sonoma State views Pendleton City Schools schools is is so um, such a rich we have such a rich program that if you you're a student and you graduate from one of our schools, you have automatic admission into Sonoma State. So, like I said, we still have some work to do. Um, there will have to have some sort of minimum qualifications for A through G, um, A through G qualifications, minimum GPA. Um, but we really want, I really want to see our students have that automatic admission. Why? It's not only great for those who want to go to Sonoma State, it's, it's really, for me, it's about the mindset. It's about creating that partnership, showing students. I used to, at a, at a certain point in my career, I taught first grade. I used to take my first graders in LA to UCLA, go and look at the campus. Start to get that ingrained in the mind. Let's think about your future. Think about where you want to be. And this is, by the way, this is nothing. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to put a shadow on anything. Anything that we're doing right now with our CT pathways and our um, our career readiness and students who want to go right into a field or into a an apprenticeship, wonderful. All we're, and if you've seen what some of our electricians and plumbers need to do and what the level they need to read at, you'll, they'll, you'll appreciate this as well. We want to set students up for future success. We want them to be in that mindset of they, we want them to be all ready to go to university. Maybe they take a few years off and then, you know, five years down the road, you're in the real world and you're working and you say, you know what, I really want to go to Sonoma State. I went to PCS and so we have this partnership and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be able to go, I, I just need to, I just need to, reg, I just need to go and, and, and fill out a paper to say, yeah, I wanna come here now. So the agreement creates this bridge between Petaluma City Schools and our local university here, um, Sonoma State, um, that we think is very important. Um, and I'm just very, very excited that we're, we're here today to, to sign this MOU with, uh, with Dr. Lee. And so I'd love to invite, Dr. Lee, and feel free to, to invite any, any of the rest of your team up as well. So come on up. First of all, thank you very much, uh, the board and also uh, Superintendent uh, Harris. And so when Superintendent Harris reached out to me, interesting enough, I was thinking about the same thing. So Noma State is a university that we are very proud of. We're proud of because a lot of students have been very successful and they continue to work in our community, work on the campus of Sonoma State and be a major, major contributor to the community. Both, <laughs> thank you. And, and I think that's a very good testimony of a successful education we do. And so, so when, when Superintendent Harris reached out to me, I, I was thinking about the same thing. And this team here are the leaders of Sonoma State and we believe that Sonoma State is a treasure for the community and is a gym in the CSU system. And we want more students to have the opportunity to come and enjoy that education. It's very unique because most of our students actually get to work with our faculty member one-on-one. -on -one. Most of the students who choose the science, technology, engineering, mathematics field get to actually do experiment and research with our faculty member. And that is something very unusual in today's higher education. And we really, really want to make sure that most students are able to get that. And I think having this agreement with the, with, with the school, city school here is very critical. I think it's important. I'm a first generation college student. I came from a family that my parents did not have uh, even high school education, but they know how important to set the goal early on in my life so that I was able to actually finish high school, finish college, get my master, get my PhD. And here I am as a president of university. I think it's important to set that goal high. And we are here to work and I'm just happy to have this opportunity. And thank you very much, Superintendent. Let's, let's go ahead and do it. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay. Excited. All right. Thank you, Sonoma State, for joining us. All right. We are going to move on to Students of the Month for Kenilworth. Petaluma Junior, Petaluma High, and Costa Grande and students of the semester for Petaluma Accelerated Charter. So we're going to start with Kenilworth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Great. This is going to be great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I've known her forever. All right, so let's have the Kenilworth Students of the Month come up, Summer Hewitt and Casey Davidson. I'm not sure. Do we have our readers yeah, for, Sen for Kenilworth? I almost said Sonoma State. For Kenilworth? Oh, okay. Yes. Come on up. You're, we're, we're, we're just excited for you right here. Hello, friends. There you go. You got it here. Okay. Okay. Summer was chosen student of the month because of her consistent academic excellence and exemplary citizenship. Summer has been maintained a 4.0 grade point average her entire time at Kenworth and is described by her teachers as hardworking, dedicated, helpful, and a model student. Ms. Manera's summer's math teacher enthusiastically shared summers, comes to class every day with a smile on her face and is always kind and friendly to me and her classmates. Summer gives her full effort on all of her assignments and she is always willing to help her table partners when needed. Summer's an excellent student, and I would love to have a class full of students as kind as she is. Outside of Kenilworth, Summer is, dedicated, is a dedicated dancer for Petaluma Studio C. In July, Summer will be performing with her dance team at a national competition in Las Vegas. When Summer isn't 
studying or dancing, she enjoys reading a good book. After high school, Summer is considering attending Sonoma State University, where she would like to major in business. It is a pleasure having Summer as a student at Kenworth. We know Summer has a bright future ahead of her. Congratulations, Summer. So this is Casey. He was chosen student of the month because he is one of Kenilworth's most outstanding and hardest working students. Casey has earned a 4.0 grade point average at Kenilworth while taking seven classes. Casey's teachers share that he is conscientious, hardworking, and produces work of the highest quality. According to Ms. Moneris, Casey's Math 1 teacher, Casey is an excellent math student. Casey puts a great deal of effort into each assignment and often goes beyond what is required of him. He has a strong understanding of math, yet Casey always pushes himself to learn more. Casey is friendly, attentive, and prepared for every class. Casey not only excels academically at Kenilworth, but he also plays the clarinet and is a valuable member of the Colts band. When Casey is not at school, he enjoys being a member of the Redwood Empire Gymnastics Program. Hmm. Casey has been participating in gymnastics for five years and shared he really enjoys the rings. After high school, Casey would like to attend a good college in California and study engineering and computer science. Casey has been a great Colt and we are proud to have him at Kenilworth. Congratulations, Casey. Wonderful. And can we have Summer and Casey's family and friends please stand and be recognized as well? All right, congratulations. Okay. The Petaluma Junior team can come on up. Hello, my name is Stella Napoli and I'm ASB president of Petaluma Junior High School. And I am proud to introduce our December students of the month. We'll start with Lucas. Lucas was chosen by his teachers as student of the month due to his focused, compassionate, respectful, hardworking and academically curious approach to learning. Math teacher, Mrs. Garvey describes Lucas as polite, purposeful and trustworthy. In school work, he pushes himself to get most of the lesson and will volunteer in, cl in class. Sorry. He gets along with other students and is capable of both learning or working as a member of a group. Both and PE and sorry, PE and advanced math are two highlights for Lucas at PJHS. He also enjoys having time to visit with his friends during break and lunch. Lucas always keeps extreme extremely busy outside of school. He has been doing Taekwondo for the past seven years and has just earned his black belt. Earning that belt required extensive commitment. He had to put in 10 hours of community service, complete a 10 mile run, and finish a four hour physical fitness test to receive his belt. In the spring, Lucas plays baseball with Petaluma National Little League. He has also completed his father's safety course. He hunts blacktail deer with his father and grandfather every fall. When he is not doing all these activities, he also works for his family business, Dalsini Plumbing. After PJHS, Lucas looks forward to the opportunity to take new electives such as shop and mechanics at Petaluma High. He also hopes to play baseball one day for the Trojans. We asked about the future. Lucas shared, I I might work for my family business, go to trade school, or go to law school. There are many things that interest me, but I know that I will work for Dalsini Plumbing for at least a little while after I get out of high school. Congratulations, Lucas. And next we, and next we have Kelsey Chapel. Kelsey has been chosen by her teachers as student of the month because of her res responsible and authentic approach, enthusiastic approach to learning. Math teacher Mrs. Garvey celebrates that Kelsey commits 100% to any activity that she engages in and raises the standard of performance. 
Often there are lively discussions in our math groups. Kelsey is friendly and optimistic in manner. Her work authentic is outstanding. When asked to describe what she enjoys most about PJHS, Kelsey's highlights were from her science class and history classes. Outside of school, Kelsey actively participates in Petaluma's North Coast Ballet in California. Once Kelsey enters high school, she is looking forward to the new opportunity for electives and a wide variety of AP and honors classes. Kelsey has ambitions for life after high school. She plans to study history and political science in college with the goal of eventually becoming a member of Congress. Congratulations, Kelsey. <laughs> Okay, and can Lucas and Kelsey's friends and family please stand and be recognized? Hey, wonderful. All right, up next, Casa Grande, Avery King, and Grace Pytel. Hello, I'm Emberly Pepidong and I'm Vice President at Costa Grande High School. Our first student of the month is Avery King. Avery King is a hardworking student athlete. All throughout high school, Avery has taken many opportunities to advance in school and challenge herself with various AP level courses. While juggling between school and homework, Avery has also played her favorite sport, basketball, on the Costa Grande girls varsity team for three years now. She has even earned the position as a captain on the team. She's also adventured into extracurriculars outside of Costa Grande. Over this past summer, she attended a camp under the Stanford Neurodiversity Project, and she is now a part of a committee called NNEA, which works to advocate for neurodiverse people in K through 12 schools. Outside of school and extracurriculars, Avery loves spending time with her parents and her older brother. On top of that, she enjoys hanging out with her friends whenever she can find the time, which can be quite difficult. She even shares many classes with Grace Pytel, and the two have become quite the power duo in all their APs together. And our next student of the month is Grace Pytel. Grace is a current senior at Casa Grande High School. She is dedicated to her academics and has taken over eight AP and college courses throughout her time in high school. Grace is planning to major in applied mathematics at a four-year university and found her love for math in her first calculus class with Miss M. She shares almost all her classes with Avery, whom she loves learning and fostering a fun classroom spirit with. Within her classes, she is an active participant and finds it important to make connections with her peers to create an inclusive environment for everybody. Aside from school, she enjoys spending her free time with her friends and family, especially her dog Dixie and her two cats. She has done volunteer work with Sip Shop, a workshop to help children who have not neurodiverse si si siblings to find a place and share their experiences. She attributes her academic success to the support of her parents, Ed and Kathy, and her older brother, Charlie. Congratulations, Grace. We would love to have Avery and Grace's friends and family stand and be recognized. Next up, Petaluma High. All right, my name is Kenna Lowry and I am Paluma High School's ASB Vice President this year. Um, we're gonna start with Bruno. 
Bruno Belforte is a senior at Petaluma High School and is very actively involved in the museum program on campus, which happens to be here tonight. Um, he leads tours and teaches the newest generation of Petaluma Wildlife Museum students what they need to know about exotic animal husbandry. Bruno has put in countless hours of individual study and research outside of class on just about every single animal, live or taxidermy, on display in the museum. Bruno came to the program in his junior year and has already mastered every aspect of the class. He adds something new and exciting to his endlessly evolving and personalized script as visitors can feel young Maven's passion to the point that they have no choice but to end up caring about the creatures and concepts he teaches. Last year, Bruno spent six months learning and practicing exotic animal husbandry with Bonnie Cromwell and Classroom Safari and continues on this year as one of Bonnie's animal presenters at birthday parties and educational events. Bruno is going to be up to his eyes in animals this year, and there's nothing that would make him happier. He has completed over 400 hours of community service through his involvement with the museum and the classroom safari. In addition to his involvement with the museum, Bruno is also an honor roll student, has taken multiple honors in AP classes in high school, and has a, had a part-time job. After high school, Bruno hopes to attend a four-year university and continue his studies in zoology or marine science with a concentration in wildlife slash marine conservation. Ultimately, Bruno wants to work with wild slash exotic animals in some capacity, research, conservation, public policy, and or education. And it's safe to say he's had an excellent start. Next up, we have Kirsten. Kirsten is a senior at Petaluma High School who looks forward to graduation in June. She hopes to attend Cal Poly and major in accounting. She has danced ballet since she was two years old and has recently completed her 11th Nutcracker. She also competed in cross country and lettered in track and field as a junior. She has been a member of the band for four years, including the wind ensemble and jazz ensemble, where she plays the trombone. Her favorite teachers in high school have been Miss Redfield and Miss Lunibus, who supported her during her challenging junior year. All right, can Bruno and Kirsten's friends and family please stand and be recognized as well? Wonderful. All right. Next up is Pax. We have Benjamin and Andrew. All right. Let's see the Zoom person. One sec. Welcome, you guys. So, Andrew, 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 Ben already knows that we owe Ben like a trophy in a box because his, <laughs> his time is not here. He's, we're going to make up. We have your presenter who's coming on in just a second. Hello, my name is Jason Ragusas. I'm an eighth grader at PAX, and these are the soon of the semesters for seventh grade and eighth grade. The student of the semester for seventh grade is Benjamin Martin. Ben's humble yet determined approach toward learning shines through in all that he does. Ben is extremely kind, considerate, polite, and respectful, but he is a force to be reckoned with when it comes to his academic ability and his determination to succeed. Ben works hard to push himself outside the box in an effort to dive into the curriculum and explore concepts with depth and complexity. Ben is also an amazing self-advocate we continually ask his teachers how he can continue to improve and grow on his already outstanding work. Ben is truly an example of a student who strives for excellence, performs at a distinguished level, and exemplifies what it means to be a kind person. Ben's parents shared that Ben was born with a gift for absorbing knowledge and information. One day, when he was just a young toddler, before he could talk in more than two words, he suddenly pointed to an E written on a page and said, E. Then he proceeded to do the same correctly for other letters of the alphabet he saw. He didn't do it to be noticed. He seemed to just be confirming aloud for himself what they were called. We were amazed and could even ask him how he knew what he knew or how long he'd known. 
because he was too young to even understand the question or give an answer. He just knew. And that was our introduction to Ben, the learner. Ben has always been far more interested in pursuing the challenging and the complex. When Ben was eight years old, he decided that he wanted to teach himself Japanese. He does these things for himself, from his own interests, never looking for approval or trying to impress. His own standards are high and they're good enough for him. He's carried over this integrity and self-respect in his relationships with friends, peers, and teachers throughout his life. He's kind, appreciative, accepting of others, and has a humility that supersedes his gifts. He's the best friend anyone could want and the most engaged, generous, and thoughtful student any educator could ask for. We are so proud of him. Congratulations, Ben. We know you're meant for great things in your future, and we cannot be more proud to award you with PAC Student of the Semester. The student of the semester for eighth grade is Andrew Lang. Andrew's helpful and positive personality is noteworthy to anyone who interacts with him. His participation in the classroom is always purposeful, thought-provoking, and consistently shown. Andrew's desire to do well in school has allowed him to keep a 4.0 GPA at all times due to his extreme level of dedication. One of Andrew's best traits is his extremely kind heart and how he always treats his peers with the utmost respect. Currently, Andrew is part of the PAX Robotics class and team, but he is always modeling how to be a team player. Andrew's parents shared how incredibly self-motivated he is. Outside of school, he has been able to self-teach complex topics like 3D modeling, coding, and puzzle solving. He also enjoys sharing his knowledge and can often be found teaching some of his friends coding and gaming tips. During the last two years, Andrew has developed his own projects that he is proud of such as a recreation of the game Super Mario Kart and a program that tracks your current score in a game and messages all of your friends about it. <laughs> Pax is grateful to have the opportunity to teach a student with Andrew's dedication and positive approach to learning. Thank you, Andrew, and happy birthday. All right, we would love for Benjamin and Andrew's friends and family to stand and be recognized. And we would love all of the students of the month and students of the semester to please come forward and have your picture taken. Wonderful. Oh, we have side reports. Okay, so we do have a few student reports that we would love everyone to stay for, but if you absolutely have to leave to do homework, we understand that too. So we ask that you leave quiet that you leave quietly if you do need to leave. All right. So next up we have student reports for Petaluma High and Costa. Looks like Petaluma's up first.
We have our Petaluma presenter here. Yeah, she's stuck in the back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, this is Petaluma High School's site report for October to December. So the first topic I'm talking about today is making connections throughout our community and school as a whole. Um, in October, we held our first ASB conference since 2019 because of COVID and we're very excited to bring together schools from all over Sonoma County and their ASB classes and be able to join our ideas to enhance our schools and tie to the district school one of diverse and equitable education where we can join with other schools and be able to create a better environment for our schools as a whole. And we're hoping that this continues to be a tradition moving forward. Okay. Um, this year we also joined with Casa Grande to make Egg Bowl more of a community event rather than a rivalry. And so actually after the ASB conference, we joined and had a meeting about what we could do to enhance the community at the event and just try to make it a more friendly event than it has been in the past. And I think that was pretty successful. Oh. Okay, the next thing I'll be talking about is student activities, like what's been going on at our school for the last few months. Um, we had Egg Bowl, and even though we lost, we were still very happy to bring the community together and celebrate our time together. Um, and these were some highlights of the fall sports that happened. Football went to playoffs, cross country, nine runners went to NCS, and Riley Kreutz, who is a part of our ASB class as well, won VVAL for the girls, and her time like qualified her for NCAA D1 cross country, so that was exciting. And she also went to CIF. Um, for girls golf, Emily Pellman went to NCS. Volleyball beat our Crosstown rivals twice. Cheer um, is hoping to continue to win more national titles. And in girls tennis, Annie Bobber was an exceptional player on the team this year. Um, and here are the winter sports that are currently going on. I don't have many updates for them yet because they just started, but this is what's happening. Um, we also had our annual Halloween costume contest to bring people together on the holiday and be able to let people express themselves and you know, celebrate the holiday. And so these were some examples of some of the costumes that we had this year. Um, also, Petaluma Wildlife Museum celebrates 30 years on campus, which we were very happy to announce. And um, they celebrated with a Jubilee where they had tours in the mornings and then a dinner and celebration at the end. And we're very excited to have them here tonight too. Um, we're also proud to announce that 76.6% .6 of our school has been involved in dances, sports, or clubs on campus. Um, next song, we're moving on to helping our community. Um, for breast cancer awareness, we had Pie Face in the quad where you had to pay, it was like $5 to pie a teacher in the face with whipped cream. And so we were able to donate all that money to breast cancer. Um, we also have our annual holiday cheer fundraiser where we join with Una Vida, which is a local organization in Petaluma, and we're able to get canned foods. And I feel we had a very successful year this year. That was just yesterday in the classroom. Um, recognizing students and staff on campus. We every year put snowflakes up in the halls with every um, student and staff member's name on it so that they feel like 
they're more welcome in the school and that they're recognized and also so that our school looks more pretty during the winter season. Um, I know I presented an honor roll last time, but we're also very happy with honor roll in the second grading period. And this ties to the district goal two of having a diverse range of classes on campus. And so therefore students are able to fit their needs and take the classes that allow them to succeed in school. Um, here are the students of the month from October, November, and December. Um, and what's next? Moving forward, we have finals next week and hoping to end the semester strong. Also, um, ASB is currently working on changing our constitution to make it more close to what our class is actually like. And we're also working on changing the election process for our office so that everybody on campus can have an opportunity to be in office, even if they're not in ASB. And um, it's not just based on student vote so that we can have people that we really feel fit the position. And so we're hoping that moving forward, we'll be able to sustain this and have a class that's more representative of our school and just allow for opportunity for people. And um, Petaluma High School also is celebrating 150 years in 2023. So we're currently working on planning some big events to celebrate that and all the accomplishments that we've had over the years. So that's all, thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. All right, next up is CASA. It's a little wider than a slide. So it's actually in a computer back there. So just kind of up in the air. Okay. We'll see how this goes. We're learning. We're learning. Okay. Hi, um, welcome. My name is Emily Rosales and I'm Casa Grande's ASB president. So we'll just get started with our site report. So first, we're going to start off with Casa Athletics, and this is just featuring some, just some of our amazing sports. So starting off with boys and girls cross country, they just finished an undefeated season for both boys and girls. Uh, they were obviously crowned 2022 VVAL um, champions, which was incredible. And they just had their 19th annual turkey leg like relay. And it's just a very, very successful year for cross country. And next, starting up um, through the season is our wrestling. They just began with scrimmages. They're off to a great season, and the boys wrestling took home second place twice, which is a great start to the program. And featuring a wrestler, Kayla, who also took second place, which is even better. And next, we have our cheer team. They just actually had two competitions, and they both placed in both competitions, JV with first and varsity in third. And this season, the varsity team is starting in a new division, the intermediate division, which is more competitive than the one they have been previously. And last year's varsity team was recently received their CIF rings from their first place win. And we had our traditional Egg Bowl halftime, which was very fun being a part of it. I think it was amazing. It's a great tradition. And up next, we have our football and they had their annual Egg Bowl game for both JV and varsity. After 10 games, JV remained undefeated the entire season, which is great for our future. And varsity made it to first rounds of playoffs against American Canyon, but sadly that was it, but still hope. And with that, the football season ended like so. And up next, we have just any school events that have been happening. Starting off, as Kenna mentioned, um, there was an ASB Making Connections Leadership Conference. Um, Petaluma held it, and we spent the day there, as well as athletes from Petaluma and Casa Grande met on the other side of town at Casa Grande to have a leadership and like bonding experience just to get ready for any sports and athletics just to maintain balance. And multiple ASB programs attended from the area, which was great because we got to hear new ideas and different skills and ways we can manage our programs differently. And at the very end, Petaluma High ASB and our ASB combined to find a way to make our community better and prepare for Egg Bowl Week. And we also had our Sights and Sounds Weeks, which can like 
had a bunch of performances from our choir on the quad and featuring amazing students, Christina and Jeremy, who can sing and play the piano like no other. Um, we also had art from some of the art students, as well as special performances from our dance team and jazz ensemble, and they are just very great, let me say. And up next, we had our Egg Bowl Spirit Week. As you can see, we get lots of participation and there was our flyer to the right. It was very on the theme. That was our theme leading up to Egg Bowl. And up next, we have the Egg Bowl game. Casa Grande did, win, did beat Petaluma High with a 29-28 final score. It was very close and it was a great game for those that were able to attend. Um, it's a great tradition that we both have, and I think it was well presented with respect and pride for both sides. And featuring our ENCR Hat Tree fundraiser, some of the students are actually here today. Um, we had our um, fundraiser event, which happens every year. Um, it takes place at the Lucchese Center, and over $50,000 were raised to continue the program. And I had the privilege to be working there as well and meeting some of you guys as well that showed. And Congressman Jared Huffman was present, which is a very big deal, and we were very proud to have him. And then we also held our Wellness Week, which ASB puts on, which allows students to receive extra support and relaxation for the week for those who need it. Um, it takes place from November 7th to the 10th, and some fun things included puppies for those that need that just want to have some puppies during lunch and just pet them and play with them and have a great time, as well as coffee and hot chocolate just for those students who think they need it for the extra boost in the morning, as well as kindness rocks, which students are able to decorate and just put around kind messages around our school. And now we feature our Casa Grande band, which they performed at our annual Veterans Day Parade. And we have featuring our drum majors, Rona and Adith. And of course, the band director, Mr. Millard. And they worked very hard and practiced several times after school leading up to this event. And next we have our Redwood Empire Food Drive, which is held by ASB. A committee worked with the Redwood Empire Food Drive to collect any canned foods and acceptable food to donate all back to them. And what is pictured is only some of the many, many boxes we were able to have. And to make it more fun, we had a little competition. So the most, each second period class, the most that brought in was given free donuts. So that made it a bit more fun to give back. And next we'll be featuring some clubs and classes around our school. So our Mecha Club uh, um, decorator, the ofrenda for um, Dia de los Muertos, which is honoring those loved ones that have passed. And I think it's great that they're able to bring their culture into our community because that's all that's what we're all about. And at Big House Catering, the culinary classes are practicing and making delicious breakfast foods. I've tried it and let me tell you, it is good. <laughs> Every staff, um, they provide sample foods for every staff meeting, and it's just great for staffs and teachers. And they're also preparing for holiday fair, which I will mention later. And up next for our BSU, which is Black Student Union, the officers from BSU visited a couple classrooms to share their experiences with hate crime to spread awareness of this event. And they also attended a leadership conference at USF just to get more of an idea and have more support behind it. And up next, we have our National Honor Society, which over 200 applicants were accepted, which I feel really says something about our community and the amount of people that want to put in the extra work and be more involved. And they had their first meeting a couple weeks back just to discuss activities and scholarships. And they were led by students featuring Grace Pytel, who was our student of the month. Um, and yeah. Up next, we have our grade levels, which is featuring each of the grade levels we have present. So starting off with the freshman class of 2026, they are preparing to sell churros at Holiday Fair. Again, I'll get more into. Um, and they've hosted multiple dine and donates, as you can see present, to start raising money for their senior prom. Even though it is a couple years away, it takes planning. And up next, same for sophomore class of 2025, but they will be selling churros and hot chocolate as well as apple cider at Holiday Fair. And those are just a couple of the fundraisers they've held so far. 
and next junior class of 2024 for holiday fair they will be selling pizza and soda and they plan on more dine and donuts especially with lombardis and right now they're in the starting process of touring prom venues um, and that's great for them they're fundraising and doing great so far And for the senior class of 2023, we will be selling DIY Dutch and tacos at Holiday Fair. And we recently had our candy cane grams, which is just a great way to fundraise for our prom. And we recently did change our prom venue to Lake Chalet, which is, pre is presented on the left side. I think it's a great venue and it'll really accommodate our school better. And here's a few things coming up in the near future. As of right now, we're actually in our winter spirit week. Today was country or country club. Tomorrow is rhyme without reason. We're really getting to the creativity of spirit week, but also comfort and a bit of easiness just because finals are right around the corner. We didn't want to make it too difficult. And as I mentioned several times, we have holiday fair this Friday, which is a great tradition we pull on, which is going to take place December 16th during lunch. And it's a great way for classes and clubs to sell foods, crafts, creations, and anything they think the student body would enjoy. And there are the flyers for each class that and their pricing. And it's a great event and everyone loves to just shop around and stay. Thank you. Thank you. That was great as well. All right. Up next, we have the United Anglers of Casa Grande's presentation. Hey. <laughs> Can't stop without saying hello to my buddy there. <laughs> All right. All right, y'all. Well, first off, thank you for allowing us to come and speak tonight. Um, my name is Dan Huvacher, if I haven't had a chance of being able to speak with you or meet you. Um, I want to start off by, see, I didn't get the, I didn't get the lowdown on which button. But I'm assuming we're just going to roll with it. Um, our, as our, our leadership led, uh, kind of still my thunder there right out of the gate, um, a really successful year with our fundraiser, um, celebrating our 40th year of conservation not only in um, Adobe Creek, but now we're branching out to the entire watershed. And that's really what I wanna to highlight tonight. Um, not only has the word been really uh, building locally here in Petaluma, but Sonoma County, and that's actually what caught uh, Congressman Huffman's ear. Not only uh, Congressman Huffman, but uh, uh, Senator McGuire has also um, definitely played a vital part in this new direction of our program, which our students will be talking about momentarily here. Um, so for all of you, thank you. Um, I, I, I can't uh, move on without really recognizing and thanking um, uh, Chris in particular with all of her communication. Um, this from the summertime all the way through the beginning of this school year, um, we've had challenges with whether it's been water, power, all the different things going on. And I, again, the support has been huge and I greatly appreciate that um, for all of you. Um, with this though, our program is changing. Um, it's not only is it growing, but as the kids are gonna talk about momentarily here, um, we're operating to more of a, a year round program. At one point we were operating where six months out of the year we were holding fish in the building and now it has grown. So with that said, I'm gonna stop talking. Um, please know um, uh, that the invite is out there for all of you. I'd love to have you guys as our guests. Um, we're getting ready to actually uh, release our fish in the next couple of months, the first release ever. Um, so with this being the case, I would love to be able to coordinate to get you guys to the site, see what's going on, see the fish firsthand. Okay. All right. At this point, I want to turn it over. Um, we have Ella, we have Logan, we have Julia and Kelsey, who will be talking a little bit about the program itself. Hi, my name is Kelsey Ferrando. I am this year's secretary for the United Anglers of Casa Grande program. So we wanted to give a little update about what we've been doing lately. So in the past month and a half, our students have been monitoring, walking through the creeks and tagging and tracking salmon in the um, Petaluma River. And so I'm going to pass it over to Julia and she's going to go a little bit more in depth about what we've specifically been doing with working with Chinook salmon in the Petaluma River. All right, thank you. 
Kelsey, thank you for the board, everyone being here. Like she said, I'm Julia. I'm the co-vice president of the United Anglers. And I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about the salmon run and the actual process of the fish and how we catch and then the process of how we collect the data. So first off, when we first get eyes on a fish, we will identify a safe location for our students to run across the bank with a basket net. This will allow us to get containment. We can also use a pulsing net but it just depends on the location. After we have gotten the fish in a safe location, have gotten containment on it, we will then usually run a skirmish line. This is basically where multiple students line up shoulder to shoulder and we have capture nets and then we will walk across the containment to identify where the fish is located. And most of the time, well, usually, <laughs> the fish will actually swim into our nets because of the motion that we are making and it's very easy to capture the fish that way <laughs> so once we have done that we will then take our cooler and we will fill the uh cooler with river water this will make it so that when we transfer the fish into this it won't give it a shock and it will be a safe environment and ensure not a lot of stress for the fish after that, we will connect a tube that is attached to an aerator on the other side, just another way to keep the fish stress levels down, safe and healthy while we are collecting the data. After the cooler is set up for the fish, we will then transfer the fish from the capture net into the cooler, and we will then identify the species and the gender. Most of the time right now, we are working with Chinook salmon. That is what we are um, focusing on. Um, we will continue like we will um, get later into Adobe Creek Stella Trout, but right now it's Chinook Salmon. With the species identified, the gender will then get a tag, which is going to be uh, green for male and orange for female. After this, we will identify if the adipose fin is present. This will basically just tell us if the fish has ever been in captivity. And if the fin is present, then we will know that the fish was um, always wild and grown wild. After this, we will measure the fork length, standard length, and total length. This just gives us more data. We will take a tissue sample, and then Mr. Hebacher will tag the fish. All of this is just going to lead into what Kelsey is about to say next, but it will help our longer outlook on the Petaluma watershed and the species that are coming into it. So you may be wondering why, if we're a steelhead base focused program dealing with Chinook salmon in the Petaluma River, well, Luckily for us, Chinook salmon and steelhead trout are very similar. They're basically cousins. And so this way we are working with them so we can get a better idea of what we're working with with the steelhead trout. And the timing works really perfectly because in the winter we work with the Chinook salmon and then it goes right into the steelhead trout. The second reason we work with them is because some of the agencies we've worked with have told us that Chinook salmon aren't supposed to be in the Petaluma River. And so this way we get to study and grow our knowledge on why they might be there. Um, so it's pretty awesome to be right there working with them. And so now Logan and Ella are going to talk to you about our permit we just gained. Hi, my name is Logan Spencer. I'm the president of the United Anglers this year. And um, we're both just up here. We're going to talk about uh, our new rescue rearing management plan, which is newly gained this year as well as um, kind of what we're gonna be doing in the future next semester, as well as going forward into the summer. So the first thing we're gonna be doing, just wanna get into this before Ella goes into the specifics. Um, with the new rescue re rearing management plan, it is brand new for any program like this. We were just um, working with other schools in the country talking about um, making new hatcheries and uh, doing other student run hatcheries. So we are proud to say that there are now other student run hatcheries like ours, but now we're kind of pulling ahead of the game again, saying that now we have a rescue rearing management plan, which is the only some, the only thing like this in the entire country. And the only other thing that is like this, we have another rescue ring management plan that is run by the government in California, but as that's the only other one in this state. So I now wanna hand it off to Ella talk, and she'll talk about the specifics of what we're gonna be doing over the next semester. 
Hi, my name is Ella Davis. I am the co-vice president of the United Anglers of Casa Grande program. As Logan has mentioned, we've talked a lot about this whole rescue rearing permit, this rescue rearing management plan, but what exactly is that? So the first thing I'm going to be talking about is the rearing aspect of this. So as of February to March is when we are going to go out into our local creeks in the Petaluma watershed. Adobe Creek is what we have the most experience with, but we will be exploring other creeks. And we're essentially going to scout the area for a steelhead trout. Once we find them, we are going to follow a similar process like Julia explained that we use to capture the Chinook to capture the steelhead trout. And in this way, the Chinook really helps prepare students for this going forward. <laughs> Once we capture the steelhead trout, we will again be taking those tissue samples, measuring them, making sure we get that data collection to help us moving forward. And we will actually be taking them into our facility. This is an incredible opportunity because Adobe Creek steelhead trout are listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened. So this requires a lot of permits and it's a great opportunity for us to be able to do this to begin with. So we will essentially take them into our facility and we will, from there, we will be taking care of them, raising them and prepared to send them out to the ocean in about a year. Now the rescue aspect of it is a little bit different. We'll be, we will be starting that in May and it will carry out all the way through the summer and into November. The rescue aspect is where we will be again capturing steelhead trout. However, instead of bringing them into our facility and raising them and preparing them for the ocean and to continue in the watershed that way, in this way, the steelhead trout will actually be relocating them to safer locations. As the creeks are drying up, as the uh, creeks stop flowing, we will be able to take them to safer locations to ensure their survival. And we would like to share a couple video clips with you of our progress this year, and just to give you an idea of what our program is truly about. Thank you. <laughs> just press it again. Just press it again. This is the Petaluma River. <laughs> it does not smell good. <laughs> so this is right over by Payran Street. So where Lynch Creek comes in. Yeah, a lot of you go right past it on a regular basis. Um, this next scene here is the skirmish line Julia was talking about um, and one of the fish being collected. What if it like went over and then went into their nets? Nope, right in front of us. There it goes. Get up. Oh, Yay! Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. So cool. <laughs> oh yeah. This was one of the earlier fish. I believe this was the first fish caught this year. Um, but as Autumn's gonna find out, they're they're they are a big animal. <laughs> <laughs> This fish has been tagged, measured, all the data has been processed. Now it's just a matter of releasing it. Let it go do its thing. Gotta hold this. Hold it. Grab it. No. Right. If it swims away, let it. But if it's not fighting you, just cradle it and let it, it will swim from you. Let him just, you know, when he's ready to go. <laughs> so thank you guys. I'd be happy, we would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, when were Chinook salmon discovered in the Petaluma River? I've never heard that they were there. So uh, I'm fascinated. I do see fishermen out there, but. Fair enough. So um, the, the Petaluma River, primarily you'll see uh, people fishing for striped bass. Um, there are carp, there are striped bass. Um, there are other smaller species of fish that um, are in the watershed itself. Um, but Chinook salmon have been there we've noticed since 1987, 1986. Um, and that's really how this all stemmed was when we started 40 years ago, um, Adobe Creek drew our attention to steelhead trout. But um, during that time, um, it was basically trying to disprove this idea of, um, well, really answer the question as to why these fish are showing up. While we were doing that and conducting these surveys, all of a sudden we were getting reports of people going, there's fish showing up, but 
we don't know if they're steelhead, what are they? And little did we know, they were Chinook. Um, and from that, Chinook are primarily a large river system um, species. Um, so with that being the case right now, they're just they're the perfect tool for our kids to get this hands-on experience. And as Ella had mentioned, it really has transitioned into this perfect, you know, almost like a dry run into what's happening in the spring. Where does the data go that you collect on the these fish? So um, for both of the both of the fish, it's handled a little different. The Chinook salmon go out to Sacramento. Um, Fish and Wildlife basically has an archive out there. Um, the current position on Chinook salmon and the, the, themselves is that they're wandering strays of the Sacramento River. Um, when the founder, Tom Furr, retired, um, I was contacted by Fish and Wildlife and they asked the question, why are you trapping these salmon? What's, what's the whole reasoning behind this? And um, they're like, they're not supposed to be here. I'm like, what? What do you mean they're not supposed to be here? And they're like, they're, this, is, this is the case. And they're like, have you, do you have any evidence? They asked me, do you have any evidence to support the claim that they're supposed to be here? And I looked and I'm like, valid point, do you? Do you have any evidence to say they're not supposed to be here? And so it was really the perfect you know, jumping point to go, let's do this study. Let's let these kids get this experience to answer this question. Now, with that, the steelhead are handled a little different. You can't have not only steelhead, but any tissue, anything in your possession under ESA, the Endangered Species Act. So with this new permit, it allows for us to be able to have these samples particularly, particularly analyzed. Originally, the idea was there is a geneticist down in Santa Cruz that does the work with National Marine Fisheries. Um, but unfortunately, there's so much emphasis with the status of coho salmon that steelhead are not getting the same attention. So that burden has been put back on us to go find a geneticist to run these samples. So that, I found that out last month. So um, our next hurdle, our next you know, endeavor, but um, it's gonna be really important for us at this point to kind of not only know what's best practices, but the concern right now is the numbers are declining so fast. What does that mean for genetic diversity? And we all know, I mean, since the basics of biology that uh, diversity is key. Um, and if our population this year in particular, we have all of the fish that we could find in the Petaluma watershed in our building right now, all of them, all the fish that we pulled these steelhead or, or, or the, that we pulled these fish from, the area we pulled them from was about 200 feet in Adobe Creek, nowhere else could we find them. So with that being the case, if they did not come into our building, they dried up on the rocks. So, you know, there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered, but what an opportunity when it comes to science and so much more. Um, how difficult is it for you guys to eat fish after working with them? <laughs> as long as it's not steelhead. I yeah. Don't yeah. <laughs> Valid. Thank you. Good question. I have a question for each of you. I'd love to hear what drew you to the program and what's your favorite part of the program. Um, personally, for me, my sister was also in the program, so I have been hearing about it, and I've been going to the fundraisers since I was in eighth grade, so I immediately knew I wanted to take the program. I kind of forgot the second part of your question, but yeah. <laughs> your favorite part. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I would say, honestly, as a second year student, it has definitely developed into a different new perspective for me and seeing the first year's interactions and like I went through it. So I know all their emotions and everything and being able to watch it again and help this experience for them because we all have opportunities to be involved with the ANCR class is probably my favorite. Also the salmon. <laughs> um, I actually wrote my college essay about this. I um, taking my the tour of the hatchery during freshman orientation. I've always been like so fascinated with just fish and conservation and ocean life. And I've also been a Marine Mammal Center volunteer last year. And so just having multiple experiences with working with animals that are struggling and just conservation in general has been such a passion of mine. And so taking this opportunity was obvious that I needed to. Um, and my favorite part about it is definitely being in the field, um, sitting and waiting for the fish is probably the best part of hatchery. <laughs> the jokes we crack 
sitting there for two hours, just waiting for a fish. It's, <laughs> it's a great, great part. Yeah. Love hot trips. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, just the it's community fine. of it. Um, so I guess what drew me in was I took a tour of Casa in like eighth grade. And I was like, huh, this seems kind of interesting. Not going to lie. I didn't think about it with COVID and everything. I take the first year class last year and Hugh Walker's talking about all these things they do. And I was like, I kind of want to do that. And next thing I knew, I was like on leadership and like waist deep into Sewer water, like gross <laughs> water, gross, gross river water. It's the puddle of a river. I yeah, swear. Yeah, yeah. I it. <laughs> it smells it like has an odor. About it. <laughs> it smells like sewer water. But anyways, I I just I was drawn to it because I love working with animals. It's something I've always been passionate about. So it was just like, wow, this is an incredible opportunity, and I I just dove into it, and now I'm here. Um, and honestly, my favorite part of it, as much as it sounds cor corny, and Kelsey kind of touched on it is like the amazing community we have. I remember an advanced student telling me last year, back when I was the first year and first getting involved, that he's never met anyone he didn't like working at the hatchery. And he, that student was Dylan and he was absolutely right. The community is amazing. So you get to work with animals and with amazing people. And I'm just really grateful for that. All right, um, so unlike all three of them, I did not get a tour of the hatchery at eighth grade. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened, but um, I actually, I had physical science with Mr. Hubacher and he did his presentation about what uh, environmental conservation the class was about and then also what they were going to go into. And that's when I really thought it's like, oh, I should probably do this. This looks really cool. So, and then I went in in junior year and I did it and then um, I just fell in love with it. And over the summer, I actually, I helped catch the Adobe Creek steelhead trout that we have in the building right now. And Ella was also there with us. And it was, that's really what solidified actually wanting to go into doing the second year of it, as well as like actually being able to see like the behind the scenes work of the fundraiser and like the logistics of everything and how it all worked. And probably my favorite part, ooh, um, everything's really fun. Um, the fundraiser was a really fun experience. Um, yeah. <laughs> the fundraiser was really fun. Um, salmon run, that's, that's always an amazing experience to be able to do. I did that last year as well. And also I'm looking forward into being able to go out and do our, use our rescue rearing management plan and use that to be able to grab and uh, take in more Adobe Creek steelhead trout coming into next semester. I just want to thank thank the students. You were just these eloquent eloquent speakers, <laughs> really kind of expressed and brought to life the your experience in the hatchery. And I just want to really commend uh, Mr. Hubacher for all your work. Um, for the United Anglers of Casa Grande, it's inspiring, and just to see what what this you know level of passion from an educator um, can have, what kind of impact it can have on on students. And as a as a parent in our district, it's just it warms my heart to see. I want my I want my children to do this, and so I know that the rest of the parents in here are thinking, I want my child to be have this experience. And so, just want to thank you so much for for everything you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, wonderful. All right, up next, Petaluma Wildlife Museum presentation. In order, guys. Yeah, it's the nation's only high school student-run natural history museum. I have 64 kids that I teach how to run a museum. 
the concepts that I teach my kids, they reflect more of the modern day conservation issues that we're dealing with. Things like habitat loss, things like poaching, things like climate change. There's aspects of animal husbandry that have to occur with this. There's aspects of building and exhibit maintenance that have to come with this. There's aspects of public speaking and giving tours that have to come with this. When a family comes here on the weekend, they can expect to be brought into this really immersive environment with all these different animals, all these different things to look at. We have really cool animals and really cool taxidermy, and then after we get them with that hook, we tell them about the animal, and we tell them what they can do to help conserve them and what other people are doing to help conserve them. We're teaching kids about conservation stories and really showing them animals and getting them inspired about protecting animals. Our goal is to influence the next generation of conservationists through ecological education, and I think this is a great place to start. The program started with one major taxidermy donation from the uh, legendary former mayor of Santa Rosa, Hugh Cotty. He wanted to shut down his uh, natural history museum, so he was looking for places to get rid of his taxidermy. Ron Head, our, our wonderful visionary founder, he goes up to the Cotting Natural History Museum. They have a handshake deal where Cotting donates the entirety of his collection. Ron Head used all of his connections as a teacher, all of his networking that he had built in his 35-year career as a teacher to bring people in from this community to build this place. This was all for kids in the community you know, to learn and be mystified and be inspired by wildlife both in the past like our T-Rex or wildlife in the present like our snakes. Uh, we have roughly 40 live animals in the museum. We have birds, we have mammals, and we have reptiles and amphibians, and we also have insects. Part of what the students do is give tours here at the museum to the elementary schools. And recently, because of the COVID precautions, Mr. Takata developed what he calls the zoo hall, where he takes a group of students and a particular set of animals, and we take it to the school so that the elementary schools don't miss out on this experience. Their faces light up and they start smiling, and all their attention goes to that snake. And I get to find that perfect moment to also say, hey, you know, this animal's kind of in trouble. You, you want to see what you can do to help it? I think that's probably the most amazing part, just, you know, getting people interested in things that they don't hear about very often. They're learning something that they haven't learned before, and it just shows in their face, and that's such a special thing. It's shown me how important it really is to teach these things to people and to get this information out there because that's the only way we're going to be able to make a difference is by telling more people and showing them how they can help. After 30 years, we're still impacting the community. We're still impacting the students. I learned like just how big the world is, really, and how much we still have to learn. And so now my college major is zoology. I will come back to this museum for the rest of my life. I'll be 80 years old and I'll take my great-grandchildren here. I want to do what I can to inspire my kids now so that they can do what they need to do as adult community members of, of our global community uh, to try and fix the problems that we've caused over the last 150 years as a species. If I can do that, shoot, that's more important than anything I could have ever done as a teacher. Shoot, I, I did something that could that could help change the world. We can correct our mistakes, that we can teach and we can influence the next generation to take action and do the right thing. Um, good evening, Superintendent Harris, President Pon, and the Petaluma uh, City Schools Board of Education. Uh, my name is Bruno Belforte, your December student of the month for Petaluma High School. <laughs> as well as a senior lead docent at the Pedlima Wildlife Museum. Um, I've been at the program for two years and it has absolutely changed my life. Um, coming out of COVID shutdown, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. But since then, I've learned to take care of a fantastic menagerie of living creatures, often animals that most people fear. I've learned about the beauty and power of wildlife, especially the fragility of the wild places and ecosystems in which they live. And most importantly, I've been given the opportunity to share my knowledge and passions directly to over 5,000 community members, ranging from ages 5 to 95, and teach them that this world is worth protecting. 
I've been accepted to early admissions at both Cal Poly Humboldt and the University of Oregon and will be pursuing an undergraduate degree in either the field of wildlife conservation, zoology, or marine biology at one of those institutions. I can tell you unequivocally that it is the people I've met, the experiences I've had, and the supportive guidance that I've been given as a part of this museum program that has been the most influential in my life thus far. Excuse me, this far. And as you should know, I have 95 other classmates in this program that are equally lucky, fortunate, and thankful to be part of the nation's only high school student run natural history museum. <laughs> When our instructor, Mr. Takata, first came to the museum in 2018, he had one section of 24 students. Since then, the program has regained its popularity and we have grown to three sections of 96 students. Historically, one of the problems of, with the museum program, despite the high level of academic rigor expected of a museum student, the class itself was worthless on a college application or resume. The course counted only as a general elective and applicable only for high school graduation and not recognized by California public universities or trade programs during the application process. Three years ago, my older brother, Fabian Romo, a museum alum who loved the program, was not able to take his, this class his senior year and sadly had to give up this experience in order to pursue his particular post high school dreams. However, for next year, fall 2023, we are proud to announce that we are retiring our current museum management course and replacing it with two new UC approved courses, both of which completely unique in the United States. Exotic animal husbandry, as well as public speaking for environmental education. The exotic animal husbandry course was penned by our instructor, Mr. Takata, along with our live animal curator, Izzy Barnes. The course is designed for students who want to delve deep and develop the knowledge base and skills associated with a possible future career as a keeper, a behaviorist, a trainer, or a vet tech. That course will be taught by our current PHS Science Department Chair, Ms. Michelle Walters, and will count as a UC-approved G science elective course. The second course, Public Speaking for Environmental Education, will be taught by Mr. Takata, and it will continue to provide our students with the support structure, instruction, and opportunities to develop as community educators as we continue to serve the people of the North Bay through museum tours, Saturday open houses, weekend tablings, and our traveling roadshow, the PDL PWM Zoo Hall. This course will be the first public speaking course offered at Petaluma High in a generation and will count as a UC approved G interdisciplinary course. If all goes as planned, the 2023 to 24 school year at the PWM will boast two sections of each course, a full 128 students learning, loving, and serving, guided by two full time teachers and backed by a dedicated, passionate, driven, and fully stocked board of directors, all of us working together to fulfill our mission to inspire the next generation of conservationists. In the three years that I've been a part of this program, I firsthand learned why it's such a popular course. Hands-on learning is not just part of our curriculum, it is the curriculum. When we say we're a student-run natural history museum, we're not joking. Every aspect of animal husbandry, landscaping, maintenance, exhibit design, and the execution of the tours happens all because of the students. We build, construct, and problem solve every handyman solution short of needing a blowtorch or a forklift. Traditional learning models aren't for everyone, and I'd say in 2022, classes that can offer an alternative ways of learning for a diverse population are needed more than ever. We are one of the few classes at Petaluma High that go on overnight field trips. My classmates and I just returned from a four-day, three-night trip to Southern Oregon to visit the 600-acre wildlife safari in Winston, as well as the Great Cats World Park in Cave Junction, Oregon. At these parks, we got to meet some amazing professional docents and keepers, learned a ton of behind-the-scenes tips and tricks, and compare the differences between wanting a for-profit versus a non-profit wildlife park. The best part was we got to meet up close and personal some of the most beautiful and majestic creatures on the planet. It was a breathtaking experience and now I can say one of my most treasured high school memories. In addition to the hands-on experiences afforded to the students at the museum, the work we do at the museum is authentic work meaning that when we give a tour or take care of an animal, it's not a test. If we aren't responsible and miseducate or scare a kid on tour, we negatively impact that kid's life and that's real. 
If we feed an animal the wrong food or don't pay attention to humidity or proper heat gradients, that animal dies and that's on us. If you are a docent at the museum, you quickly learn that while we all want to earn A's, that's not all the class is about. It's about doing your job well, serving the public and taking care of living beings that rely on our care. When you combine hands-on learning with authentic work, you create a situation where students take ownership of their education and you know what that equals, pride. I'm proud of the work I do at the Petaluma Wildlife Museum. I'm proud of what we represent. I'm proud of what we do, and you'd be hard pressed to find any veteran docent at the museum who feels any differently. Estas son las siguientes áreas demográficas con respecto a la raza y etnia en, de la, en la prepa de Petaluma. Estos son los datos demográficos de los 96 estudiantes en el programa de administración del museo del año 2022 al año 2023. El programa del museo atrae estudiantes de todos tipos de vida y somos un excelente reflejo de la diversa población estudiantil en esta preparatoria. Por ejemplo, tenemos primera generación de estudiantes de familias inmigrantes, estudiantes que se identifican como género fluido y estudiantes pertenecientes a la cuarta generación de familias agrícolas que viven en ranchos del oeste de Sonoma. En nuestro curso, todos estamos representados. Una de las razones de que el curso es más diverso es porque no hay barreras académicas o económicas que impiden, impidan participar en ese programa. Mientras el estudiante esté dispuesto a trabajar duro, participar en el cuidado de los animales y comprometerse con nuestra misión, él o ella es aceptado en el programa sin prerequisitos y sin tener experiencia. Well, that's, that's a scary contraption. <laughs> Mr. Harris, Ms. Pawn, and our honored uh, <laughs> PCS board. My name is Sydney Doyle. I am a senior lead docent at the Petaluma Wildlife Museum, and we've hope, we hope that you've enjoyed our presentation so far. We're here to ask for your support. Please consider using the Wildlife Museum and the Hatchery as, a model, uh, as model programs to serve as recruitment tools and make Petaluma City High Schools the schools of choice in the North Bay. Certain schools are known for their programs. De La Salle is known for its football program. Berkeley High is known for its world-class jazz band. There is no reason that Petaluma High couldn't be known as the school of choice for environmental educators or Casa Grande, the Center of Practical Wildlife Conservation and in Northern California, make the nation know who we are. Uh, please continue to support our overnight field trips and hands-on experiences for the students of our program. These are some of the most impactful and memory-making experiences in the entirety of the program. Both Mr. Hubacher and Mr. Takata dream of connecting with angel donors who could create foundations for their programs, providing a steady and consistent stream of funds that could be accessed year after year. You are all well-connected, respectable adults in our community with powerful friends and deep networks. If you believe in what we are doing, please help the museum and the hatchery by connecting like-minded conservation-based philanthropists to our programs so that these essential programs can be available for Petaluma teens for future generations and many more to come. Now we're gonna show you guys some of our lovely reptiles and thank you.
Good job, docents. Good job. We have just been called to have a little question session here. So if you want to bring your animals over this way, you know, we could take some questions from the board. Come on. Come on. Everyone up. We're going to answer questions from the board. I'm holding my friend. <laughs> He's my bestie. Come on, Phoebe. Sydney, come on up. Eduardo, come on up. Bring the snake. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry we didn't know we had a question session, so we're going to give our best answers and, uh, and you know go on the fly. By the way, um, you guys are always welcome uh, to come as a board. Uh, we could give you a special tour any time of the week, any time of the day. Um, Amy, if you just want to set that up with anyone. Um, we just had our 30th anniversary, and we had a very special tour that we put together for adults that not only talks about um, you know, the concepts we're learning at the museum, but it was specifically tailored for adults to find out what we're up to as well. So it, it's a, it's a, it's an age appropriate tour that would be great for you guys. And uh, we'd love to show off our museum to anyone that can show it, and especially to you guys, that it could be such a, a wonderful support, you know, for our students in the program. Any questions? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've got, well, not a question, but a request. Um, so I was really struck, well, I was struck by the whole thing and really appreciate how eloquent our students were speaking and advocating for the program. Uh, I was particularly struck by uh, the commitment to uh, equity in participation that you were able to fund. I mean, I was really struck by this, you know, that uh, no questions asked if somebody needs the assistance to participate fully in the Oregon trip or whatever, they can do it. I want to, the ask is uh, in March, we have a special study session on equity in the district. And one of the things that we want to focus on is equity and opportunities like this. Absolutely. And so we'd love to get your input on how do we make not just this opportunity, but all the opportunities that are out there that our schools offer in sports and recreation and, you know, drama and debate, everything equitable in, in opportunities. We'd love I, your to pick your brains on that. I am a teacher for social justice. I have been my 20 year career. And um, when I found a home here in Petaluma, you know, part of uh, what made this place feel like home is that I saw that there was a group of kids that were, you know, uh, historically, you know, uh, ignored. And um, a big part of that is creating the culture in your class so that every kid feels, you know, uh, feels accepted and safe in that room. And um, it's, 
it's a difficult thing to, to do, you know, especially in, you know, in a community that has such deep traditions and a lot of families that run deep. Um, I hope, and I, I think that my kids could, would feel the same way, but I hope that they, they, um, they understand how special the museum is, you know, from that standpoint, you know, we don't have the, uh, the kind of, um, gatekeeper classes or, uh, or, you know, <laughs> economic gatekeepers that, may shape the way a certain program would look. And um, that's part of the beauty of running with a board. Um, I, I, the task I give our, our nonprofit board, you know, every meeting is you need to make sure that every single one of these kids is being served, you know, from, from, uh, from our kids, you know, who are in fourth generation rancher families to our kids who are, um, you know, first generation, you know, college students that are, you know, that are coming with, uh, from families where their parents are working six or seven jobs. I mean, we have to make this available for all of our kids. And if you can't do that, then why are you here? You know, that's, that's the, that's the first, and that's, um, that's, uh, that's, that's the first part that these kids, I think they can feel it palpably. I, I don't articulate this, this to them. I just talk to them because they're my dorks. <laughs> these are my kids. And, and I also think that the fact that we have a common goal, you know, um, I teach kids that you know, come from families that are all across the political spectrum, but we leave our politics at the door because they, and they need to understand that uh, to be able to communicate, you have to, you have to have empathy first. And once you have that, then you can make that connection, whether it's teaching a three-year-old kid about a snake or whether it's talking to a, you know, a, a person who's been a big game hunter for 40 years about conservation. You know, uh, everyone has, has a, a valid perspective that they come from. And if you give these kids, you know, that respect and, and respect where they're coming from, they can start to do that with the people that they serve and the community that they serve. And, um, you know, I, I'm so proud of the work that these that these young people do. I, uh, I, you know, I am brought to tears when I think about it. I am a, a pedagogical grandfather to these kids. I teach them these lessons and, and these concepts in conservation, and they bring these, you know, to children and to members of our community. And I see that happen and I see it grow. And it's a, it's a very powerful thing to have that kind of, uh, that kind of vertical education, if you will. Um, spread throughout a community. And uh, I think the kids know that, and I think they feel that. And, um, you know, what Mia said about authentic work, that's real. You know, I, each of these kids wants to get in the class, but I, I tell them, I don't care what grade you get. <laughs> you know, are you going to do your job? Are you going to make sure that this kid, you know, walks out of here with a positive experience so that they know that, um, you know, that they want to protect something, that they want to care about something? You know, are you going to be ready to show up and take care of that tortoise because there's going to be a freeze tonight? You know, we need to make sure that that thing gets away. I mean, these are real life lessons that are that our kids are learning, you know, in addition to the academic rigor that I can give them. And I, I, I cherish the uh, the opportunities to do this at this at this museum. Um, it's a special place. Um, like people say it's, it's, it's a hidden gem in the community. It, it's more than that. It's a tool that can change these kids' lives. And I, I see that. And I see, th I see their lives changing. I've seen, kids, I've seen it happen, you know, over and over. So um, I'm also the marine science teacher at the school. And I, I learned that if you, you know, for classes that aren't AP classes, for classes that aren't the honors classes, if you drop the... Uh, if you drop the grading requirements to get into a class, you get the full gamut of kids who want to be there. And for example, in marine science, I teach you know an upper division science course. I will never say no to a kid, even if they got a D in, in biology, I will never say no to a kid who wants to take an upper division science elective. Why would I do that? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. They, <laughs> it, is, it is the same thing at the museum. Yeah, it's the same thing with, at the museum, and um, I'm I'm proud to have rewritten those courses, you know, and got the UC approved so that we can have a really full range of kids who want to be in that program, and and in, also importantly, just so that uh, public schools like the UC can give these kids recognition for what they do. I've had kids who have gotten into the into the Naval Academy, but they couldn't get into the UCs because they had these courses that meant nothing to the UCs. And I'm just like, this is a travesty. My kids can, I will put my kids up against any kid in any program in the country, you know, what they can do. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my vision for the program is to, is to make sure that whatever we are adding to it, 
um, adds to its stability. So to bring in a second teacher, um, to build the board, you know, you know, from from where it's been at. I'm sure you guys know some of the sordid history of the museum and what has happened in the past. You know, we now have responsible adults who are taking care of these kids and putting them first. And um, I, I see only positive things happening at this museum coming in the future. And I'd, I'd like to echo, you know, Sydney's sentiments. You need to use us. You know, use us, use us as a recruitment tool. You know, I, I, I would I would love for Petaluma City Schools to be known as the center of of conservation and education in the country because you have two unique programs that you see nowhere else in this country. So is this on the only student that's that right. Any questions for the kids? Like, I don't have any yeah. questions, but I just want to say thank you so much. I really appreciate all of your auth authenticity, your vulnerability, your emphasis on empathy and equity. And we've talked more recently about it's not just college or career, it's college and career. And I feel like your program really highlights that, like the marriage of those two things. So thank you. Thank you all. And students, I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming to kind of echo my same sentiments that I shared with the, um, the hatchery. Your level of professionalism, your presentation was, was spot on. I love the fact that you brought the animals. Cindy, I'll just say amen. I, I resonated so much with, with everything that you said. And um, a little, little known fact here, um, Mr. Takata and I were born 10 days apart. I'm going to say who's older. But, <laughs> but um, I, Phil, I, 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 everything you just said, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm so, um, what a, what a, what a treasure. And I think, you know, you know, we got our communications coordinator here, like, this is what we should be promoting in, in our district, the, the level of engagement, student enthusiasm, you can hear it in just the students who are speaking, how it changed, how this course, these courses have changed their lives and their trajectory. I know I've known Bruno for quite a few years from at McKinley and it's changed his life. You can see where he's, he where, where, where he's headed. So thank you so much. Thank you. I got to got walk back. <laughs> so we are going to take a five minute break. I hope Chris can turn down the AC. Okay, reconvening at 807. Um, up next is the budget revision, number one in the first interim report. <laughs> no, keep that same energy, Sheldon. Good job. <laughs> I don't even think it's fair. <laughs> I really don't. How do you follow that? Especially with the animals. I'm going to start bringing my dogs in so that they can like yeah. chase some of the snakes. Anyway, I cannot promise you as riveting of, as a presentation. I can, I can tell you that. So I've handed out some budget binders. Some of you guys have some back there too. But I'm not going to go through all of it. Um, I'm going to focus on the PowerPoint uh, and just kind of highlight some summaries from First Interim. So for those in the viewing audience that might not know, First Interim is really us presenting the financial position of the district as of October 31st, which we're required to do under AB 1200. Uh, online and in the budget binder, I've got a narrative that kind of talks about what's in the report, all of the various reports that we do, the various funds, who we are, Petaluma City Schools, as a refresher, remember we're five organizations, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Or does someone have the clicker? Thank you. See, I'm like the oldest one in cabinet practically. And so everybody's like, here, Chris, here's how you work remote. <laughs> I think there's some ageist thing going on. I don't know. Now watch it not work. Okay. 
See? I jinxed it. So we talked about how the first interim report is required by AB 1200. It's the first of two reports. We'll bring the second one back to you in March. Um, we already talked about this, so Dave, go ahead. Again, our general fund actually includes both districts, Petaluma City Elementary, Petaluma Joint Union High School District, Pengrove Charter, Mary Collins Charter, PAX or Petaluma Accelerated Charter, South County Consortium. It does not include Live Oak. So Live Oak is our independent charter. They submit their own budget. They're not a part of our financials, but the general fund is a combination of all of these funds that these organizations are accounted for in. So when we do the LCFF, for example, we do five different LCFF calculations, and then we combine them all together. And this has become in particularly important as we look at how we um, monitor and manage our enrollment and our ADA, because now that we've got three or four or five different ways of, of looking at average daily attendance or ADA, many of these are done now differently. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So, here I'm going to just refresh or let people know what is in the budget binder that we have, my infamous budget binders. Um, the first, under the first tab, you'll see the narrative and budget assumptions. You'll also find the School Services of California Dartboard. Um, for those of you that are looking, it kind of looks like this. If you're interested, um, it has a lot of information and it's what we use as we project forward into 2023, 24, and 24, 25. If you go back one page, and I want to focus on this for a moment. If you go back one page, I added um, some information here on enrollment because as we're moving forward into 2023-24 next year, and really first interim starts to contemplate that in our multi-projections, we're looking at how, how does our enrollment look? And I've kind of outlined here the CBEDS or the California Basic Educational Data System which is where every district in the state of California accounts for their enrollment as of that first Tuesday in October. You can see what our CBEDS counts were by school site, 7,521 students back in October of 19. And where we look as a month too, which is around October 7th, very close to CBEDS day. And I, I did it by school because you can really see the differences and where we're looking at really declining enrollment. Some of our organizations are looking at increasing enrollment. You look at the three charters in particular, Mary Collins, Pangrove, and PAX, they're all growing. And so when we do their LCFF calculations, we're using a very different average daily attendance projection than we are for the two secondary, the secondary and elementary that are actually declining. So I wanted to provide this information because we're going to be doing some more work in January as far as really collecting all of our feeder district enrollment information and starting to truly project using cohort projections, how we're gonna look in the out years. Why is that important? And I wanna spend just a few minutes on this is because we are in declining enrollment as evidenced by this information. 427 students represents close to a 5% reduction in enrollment. That's massive. We have had very, very stable enrollment for 20 years back before they converted those condos or those apartments into condos behind McDowell, we lost about 300 students at the time. Since then, we have had very relatively flat enrollment. We're up 20, we're down 40, up 30, down 10, give or take. This, this was, we were hoping was actually going to be a turnaround year, that we were actually gonna start seeing enrollment start popping back up. When we did the adopted budget, we had projected 7,194 students. We're 100 students below where we had projected back in May and June. Um, both high schools came in less. Um, certainly, almost every school site, including the three charters, came, except with the exception of PAX, came in less. We were projecting closer to 500 at Pengro, for example. They came in roughly 20 less. So um, almost every single school site took a dip, a bit of a dip. But the high schools in particular, um, Kenilworth, for example, came in less. We were projecting more than closer to 800. I believe Casa, we were projecting 1,700. Now this month too includes special day class. So it may look like it's higher here, but it's actually lower if you back special day class out. 
Um, they're, they're closer to like 1670 without special day class. Petaluma High School is down about 40 students. We were projecting 1,240 regular ed students and it's coming in closer to um, 1196, 1197. So we're really seeing some reductions almost across the board, but also in our, our high schools, which have actually held pretty stable. Anyway, this is really important because not only are we seeing this decline in enrollment, and remember, why am I using 1920 enrollment and comparing it to three years ago? Because that's the ADA we have enjoyed through the pandemic, the ability to use the ADA associated with 2019-20 for the last three years. And this year is the first year we're actually having to use what the, the governor is allowing us to do, which is a three-year average. And that's really, in many respects, helping to save us. Um, so not only is our enrollment down, and we're losing that hold harmless of being able to use 1920, our attendance is also down significantly. So we used to, we used to enjoy attendance rates of roughly at the elementary, like in the TK to third grade, around 94, 95% attendance. That means for every 100 days, a kid shows up 90, 95 days, right? 94, 95 days. At the high school, it was even higher. It was closer to 97%, 97.5%. Our attendance factor for last year, which was down, we know, pretty significantly because of COVID and the impacts of COVID, we were looking at anywhere from 92 to 94% attendance rates. That is pretty significant when you project out what a 1% drop for 7,000 students is equivalent to, 70 roughly ADA. And 70 ADA times roughly 10,000 is $700,000. So to try to, to, to try to put some fine points on, how does that translate to a dollars and cents? 1% of 7,000, I'm using easy math. 1% of 7,000, 70 students, 10,000 on average per student. It's different by grade span, but call it a 10,000 on average, uh, $700,000. And then you start stepping it up. If we've dropped 3% attendance, then that means it's over $2 million. And that's just an attendance drop. That's not the enrollment drop. So when you couple the drop in enrollment of roughly 5% or over 5% with an attendance drop, we're starting to get impacted. Again, we're, being, we're, we're having a little bit of safe harbor because we're able to use this three-year average. And that three-year average still includes 2019-20 as one year because 1920 ADA also was for 2021. So 1920 ADA was like a two-year ADA because there was no real ADA in 2021, which was our distance learning year. So we still have 1920 ADA for 2021. Now we're using 21-22 ADA, which we know has dropped significantly and lower enrollment. And now we're also starting to project out where do we think 22-23 ADA is going to be? Does that make sense? It's really important because when we look at projecting our revenue, not only for this year, but for the out year or the out years, um, looking at is our enrollment going to start to recover? Is our attendance going to start to recover? We had really hoped our attendance this year would be more in recovery than what we saw last year, but I, we haven't even collected our P1 data yet, which is as of next week. So we'll be looking at that over winter break and into the first week or so of January. I'm super concerned that P1 which guides us to what we think P2 is going to be, is going to be significantly lower than what I'm even projecting here. I'm using about a 94, 95%, depending on the grade level. So any questions about that? I know I'm spending a little bit of time on it, but it's just super important because it becomes the foundation for, for what our, our, the majority of our revenues are driven on. Questions? Thank you for indulging me. So after that dartboard, there's also the common message. This comes out from CESA, which is really a state organization of county offices. And they put together kind of some guide guidance or guidelines for school districts to follow. And then at the next tab, we have our spreadsheets, which I'm going to talk about and touch on in just a moment. I just want to orient you to what else is in the binder. We have our certifications. We are recommending a positive certification for this report. We have our general fund, which is the same as the spreadsheets, only just kind of in a different state format. 
I think the spreadsheets are a little bit more understandable and they're certainly a bigger font. And then we have all of the other funds. So anywhere from our adult education fund 11 to the cafeteria fund, our building fund, which is where we account for bond proceeds, our developer fee fund, our capital facilities fund, et cetera. So we have several other funds that are in there. If you have any interest, they're here. And then we have all of the supplemental information. If you go to the supplemental tab, the first, the first two pages is our ADA. So you can see the estimated ADA in our adopted budget. So page 99 and 101, 99 is our charters. And you can see that very first number, total charter school ADA, estimated original budget, 989.89, board approved, which is the same because this tonight will become the new board approved. Our estimated P2, 988, so I'm estimating a slight drop. And then our funded ADA, because again, we're using current year ADA as our funded ADA. But then look at the next tab, because this is the district. Everybody else. Our adopted budget ADA, original budget, we were estimating 6,024 roughly. And that was what we, were, we thought we were gonna be funded on. Look at our P2. ADA. This is what we're projecting as of this moment for P2. That's 300 ADA down because this estimated ADA is the three year average. Yes, I wasn't that off in our enrollment. Yes. Yeah, so see the funded ADA is the same as the original budget. So we're looking at that three year average. But I wanted to highlight the difference so that you could see how much we're dropping and how much that average versus the actual means for us. That makes sense. Um, there's multi projections in here, which we'll touch on a minute. Criterion standards, which provides all sorts of information. Cash flow, which we're obligated to provide, and we we show ca positive cash, so that's all good news. So. Unless there's any questions, we can go back to the comparative spreadsheet tab. Sorry to be jumping around. I just kind of want to show people what's in the budget binder. So we talked about ADA. We talked about all the LCFF calcs that we've done for the five organizations, um, including South County, which is part of our elementary and secondary. You can see the net change for our LCFF is highlighted in green. So in other words, the adopted budget versus this budget revision, we're increasing our, our LCFF revenue by about 2.7 million. And that's because of a couple of things. Remember in that 45 day budget, the state came in, the COLA 6.56 did not change, but the augmentation went from 3.28 to 6.7. So this is factoring in that new augmentation rate and what we think is ADA, which is of course balancing with the three-year average. And it also incorporates in our what we believe is our unduplicated pupil counts. So we've been working on that. It's not certified yet. It's still draft for CalPads because CalPads has not been certified. But our, um, our free and reduced meal and, and EL counts, the unduplicated are actually higher than what we had projected. So even though our enrollment's down, our unduplicated counts are up, which is interesting. I think it's also indicative of what the community is struggling with as far as the impacts of COVID and the pandemic. Not a whole lot of other changes. We did increase interest a bit because interest rates are up. So we'll be monitoring that closely. Obviously we have local donations on the next page. Um, you'll see what our final staffing is coming in at 1100. That's mostly because we're increasing sub costs. So when we looked at last year and what we are actually spending on substitutes for various reasons for a certificate. We've increased those up. We've also made adjustments for staffing. So we've added some staffing at McDowell. We added a, t a class at McNear because of the way that enrollments, and again, kids don't come in neat and tidy packages. So even if enrollment is down, we're looking at enrollment, not only from a purely mathematical perspective, but we're working with principals and looking at it from a class by class perspective, grade by grade. And we've also made some adjustments um, at the high school and junior high levels. 
you can see in the classified, all of those have increased about close to a million dollars. That's for that CSEA retro. So we were able to settle with CSEA. We were able to post much of that retro. The final retro for 2001-02 and 2002-03 hit Wednesday of last week. So we haven't captured everything, but we tried to capture the majority of it because it was just finally hitting just before we were finalizing this. Um, and then those driven costs are simply based on the salaries that are up above. We've also made some adjustments from um, like the certificated management came down because we had final staffing. As you know, we have a lot of new principals, a lot of new system principals. And so as we looked at that final staffing between what we were projecting at the end of May, then we were able to bring some of those salaries down. We have a lot of, a lot of first year principals. And so those salaries have come down. Posting carryover, if you look at the 43, I'm just highlighting some of the more significant. We post carryover for all those local donations. We had close to 500,000 in site carryover. So you can see that being posted here. Um, we were able to bring our insurance costs down because insurance, our final property and liability actually came in less when we got the final rates. Um, we are increasing our, our utility costs. So when we looked at, we got some of the true up bills for some of our school sites for the pg e because you know, we're on solar, so we get these little tiny invoices and all of a sudden we get a big true up bill or not, we never know. And so we did increase a lot of the water and a lot of pg &E. And I actually think it wasn't enough. We may be increasing that more at second interim when we have a little bit more um, experience for the year under our belt. Um, a lot of these are based on site budgets. As you saw the local donations up above, school sites are budgeting those and field trip expenditures and contracts for outdoor ed, et cetera. Um, looking at the next page, you'll see that our indirect costs have gone up dramatically. And that's because we posted all these categorical programs and all the carryover. And so that's gone up pretty dramatically. <clears throat> and you can see the most important thing we look at is on that page three, excess of revenues over expense. And you can see with all the changes that we've made, primarily in the areas of revenues, but some savings we've captured as well, we now have about just under $4 million of revenue over expense that we haven't settled with all of, you know, we haven't settled with our teachers yet. We haven't settled with management. And so those are all things that are hanging out there. But this is one of the line items that we look at to, to determine affordability. Going on to the next page that is our restricted. I just wanna highlight a couple things from that. You'll see some big increases in revenues. And a lot of that is we're posting carryover from our federal COVID funds. That's in that 8290. And then we're posting all those one-time grants. So, you know, we got 6.4 million, 6.6 .6 million for the, um, learning recovery block grant, the one-time money from the state. We got about 4.4 million under the art, music, instructional materials, discretionary block grant. Um, our ELOP money went from roughly 600,000 to 1.7. So that was about a $1.1 million increase. So you're seeing some of those re revenue increases here and we're budgeting that. The important thing to remember is many of those programs, we have four to six years to spend. So even though we're budgeting the full amount of what we're entitled to, most of that money is not gonna be spent. We know the art, music, instructional materials block grant, for example, we have to have a full blown plan in place approved by the boards before we can spend $1 of that. So if you look at the next page and you look at that 4,300, wow, that's gone up by $24 million. Well, that 24 million is the placeholder for those large grants that we have not yet determined how we're going to spend that money. And most of that will be in carryover ending fund balance when we close the books, because we know five, three to five years of that we're holding aside, including educator effectiveness. For example, we're getting all that educator effectiveness, but we know we're not going to spend it all in one year, but we budget it because we want our program people to understand here's the full extent of the budget to be transparent knowing that most of that will carry over in the next two, three, four, five years, depending. Okay, questions about that? I'm not gonna go into all the other stuff, but I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the most important things. If you go back to the narrative, 
I did put some information in here if someone wants a little bit more detail about So I think it's on page four. On page four, under other local revenues included are as follows. And then down below, it gives you new state one time, the learning recovery, the art, music, instructional materials, some of the COVID revenues that we still have left over between the state and the federal. So I've kind of listed out here what some of those buckets of money are that are included in those revenues. So if someone wants a little bit more detail in, in what's con what constitutes that 8290 and the 8590 increases, some of that information is here. It's not the entire amount, but it's, it's a significant portion of it. Okay. Is there any questions about what I've gone over so far? Again, I'm sorry, I don't have any snakes or turtles or toads or cats or dogs. So Dave, if you would go to the next slide for me, please. Okay, so let's just look at it at, at the 30,000. We're gonna go back up to the 30,000 on the PowerPoint and hopefully I made this font large enough. So this is just kind of looking at the adopted budget versus this budget revision, what we were projecting for revenues for each major category versus what we're projecting now. So you can see that LCFF went up close to 3 million. You can see the federal funding went up. And of course the biggest increase is that other state. Parcel tax has not changed at all. I'm not even sure that we're gonna collect this amount, um, but we'll see, I'm hopeful, especially for the secondary with all the development on the west side of the freeway that we're gonna start seeing some bumps in the secondary parcel tax. Um, and then you can see other local, the majority of that increase in other local is tied to the school buses. We still have um, three or four school buses we have not yet received, therefore we have not yet paid, therefore we have not yet reimbursed for. So we're budgeting that and the infrastructure for, for that, um, that, that is in design right now. We're hoping to go under construction in the spring. Um, it also includes some of that preschool grant, you know, the preschool building on the corner of Maria McDowell is well under construction and some of that carryover for that preschool grant that's paying for that or helping to pay for that as part of this. And then there's a lot of um, career tech ed and the capital, which we'll look at the capital outlay in a minute. Then on the expenditure side, you can see, again, I'm putting this as total general fund, I'm lumping it in large major categories, certificated, classified, employee benefits, books, supplies, services, capital outlay, other financing, and just kind of the changes. You can see that capital outlay, it went from 586 to 3.7 million. And again, buses, infrastructure, career tech ed, preschool building. Those are the majority of what that capital out, outlay is made up of. Mm -hmm. Uh, where is the bond? I mean, have we sold the bonds? Are we in the process of selling them? Where is that reflected? I. It's um, it's under the um. It's yes, a, it's it's under yes, restricted. Yes, we did sell them. Oh. Yes, we completed that in August. We had a successful bond sale, so I'm happy to report that. If you go into the other funds tab, all other funds, okay. that is in Fund Twenty One, which is the building fund. And so some of that information is reflected there. That's where we account for the proceeds from the sale of bonds. Okay. Okay. But Thank good you. question. Thank you for that. There was something else in here. Okay. So again, this just highlights um, the other expenditures. So then looking at the changes in components of ending fund balance, how did our net ending fund balance end up? And this is again, the combined, it's not restricted or restricted, it's the combined of unrestricted and restricted. And you can see our total revenues, one, um, 107 million have increased to 130 million. 
And our total expenditures have gone from 108 million to 140 million. As I told Matthew, that total expenditure is 140 million when I got here. Because when you when someone says to you, what's your total general fund budget? It's what's it, it's that 140 million. When I got here, I think it was in the 80 some odd, 89 million bucket category level. Anyway, so um, those total expenditures, that, that is our total general fund right now is about $140 million. Um, you can see this shows a huge deficit. We're spending almost 10 million more than we're, than we're taking in. But remember, that's mostly one time based on one time revenues. So that is not deficit spending. When we think about affordability, we only look at the unrestricted side when we think about affordability because the restricted side, we know we're budgeting all sorts of categorical carryover like career tech ed money so that Tony and the career tech ed teachers have access to those funds. That's typical. You wanna see, or you expect to see deficit spending expenses exceeding revenues in the restricted side. You don't expect to see that generally in the unrestricted. And then you can see the ending fund balance, beginning fund balance, and the net change. And then this is just the components of ending fund balance. You can see our beginning fund balance, and you can see from adopted budget, 11 million went up to 26 million now. That's because when we closed the books, a lot of that restricted carryover kicked in. And that was a lot from COVID money and other restricted um, budget or categorical funds. And then you can see we maintain revolving cash, um, our 2% reserve for economic certainties that the board sets aside in addition to the 3%. Um, and then the South County ending fund balance. So the South County maintains their own reserves. They're included in our adopted budget. And so we disclose those here. And then you can see the available over the reserves. That $8 million, um, that's the amount of money in the restricted. If you look at that first page that we looked at. I wanted to highlight this just for a minute. This is the state teachers retirement system and we're gonna look at PERS in a minute. We have finally hit the target, if you will. So remember back in 2013, 14 and prior, we only had a, a STRS contribution of 8.25 and that had gone on for many, many years. Teachers on the other hand paid in 8%. Theirs is up to, I think 10.15. Um, and so because of decisions that were made previously, they have had to increase that STRS rate dramatically from 8.25% to 19.1. And um, every year we've been having to add this huge expense to our budget without any funding behind it. So I'm happy to say that we finally hit that 19.1 and at this point it's not projected to go up. These increases were set in stone in law back in 2011, 12. So they had, created that as an automatic. There was a couple of fluctuations that the state made budget by budget, but generally speaking, that 19.1 was established about 10 years ago, okay? And then if you go to the next slide, and, that, and the dollar amount on the side kind of represents what the increase in cost was. Um, so going to the next slide, if you would. So this is the PERS rate. So the PERS rate historically was 13.88%. Um, and then you can see that again, same issues with the PERS um, retirement fund, but the PERS, the PERS board establishes these rates every year. So it's not set by law, whereas STRS is set by legislature. Um, and you can see they've gone up um, to about 25.37, which is what it is right now. So for every hundred dollars we pay someone who's a member of PERS, it costs us $125 just for CalPERS. For a teacher, or, or Cal STRS for every hundred dollars, it costs us $119. We have not hit the top yet. Luckily in the DART board, they're projecting next year to be relatively flat for the CalPERS rate, but we won't know what that rate actually is until we get into June. And that's when the CalPERS board um, makes those determinations. So in our multi-projections, since I've been here, we've had to add these huge increases in costs. And finally, I think we're, knock on wood, finally, I think we've reached the end of that. So that's good news. I just wanted to share that with everyone and also remind people like this is all real money that we had to cover without any additional funding from the state. Okay, Dave. 
And this is just kind of the enrollment historical seabed. So I just kind of updated it. And when I said we main, remained relatively flat, you can see since 2910, 7634, 7548, 7501, 7533, 7601, 7492, 7500, 7480, 7434, 7528, et cetera. And then we hit the, the pandemic year, the first full year where we were in a pandemic at seabeds, we dropped at 73, 77, 7202 last year. And now we're estimating it at about 7,094. And that's as of the second month. So this is just kind of quantifying, you know, how we've looked over the past 12 years, 12 to 13 years, and why, you know, having relatively flat enrollment has been a good thing, but over the last three or four years, seeing this level of decline is concerning. So I talked about a little bit earlier, we're gonna be spending some time in early January collecting our feeder district enrollment data so that we can use all that data because they feed into our secondary district. So we can really start projecting out over the next um, three to five years based on cohort enrollment, what does it look like? Where does it look like we're going? Are we, are we remaining flat? Are we declining? Are we, are we starting to grow? We've got TK implementation over the next three years. And so what, what does that do for enrollment? Because that kind of changes um, our enrollment a bit. So we're gonna see, cause that means kids get, I'll get two years of, of kinder and ultimately all four-year-olds will, will have that. So we'll be taking a close look at that. And this is again, trying to quantify kind of some of those funds. So this is some of the federal carryover we have um, in, the, in the COVID carryover, the ESSER two, the ESSER three, there's, you can see there's four buckets of ESSER three. This is across all of our um, five organizations. Um, and, and the ones in, it looks like purple, but it's really supposed to be blue, has to be spent by September 23. And then the ones in green, September 24. A lot of this um, is being eaten up this year. And we're gonna be looking at, now that we've settled with our bargaining unit for classified, and we're gonna be looking at how much revenue do we have left? And then what can we project for 2023, 24? But there's a lot of positions that are funded by this money. So we're gonna to have to take a close look at that for January and February. And then this is some of the state money. You can see the new learning recovery block grant. We talked about that, the new COVID, uh, the new art, music, instructional materials block grant. And this is some of the state COVID money that's left over. You can see we have about $2 million of ELO or um, extended learning opportunities, in-person instruction. A lot of that has paid for like our additional custodians and all of our PPE and additional cleaning products, et cetera. And then we've got some special ed learning recovery. So thank you for indulging me on some of the finer points of the budget. I'm sorry, I couldn't make it more exciting. I didn't even have time to add graphics. In, in hindsight, I should have added some lizard pictures and stuff in my PowerPoint. Um, so with that, we're down below in the action item, we'll be presenting this for action and recommending a positive certification. It did not go through multi projections. Um, I really feel like they'll become even more important as we get into second interim and have a better idea of our, it does show that we maintain about 4.4 million in revenues over expense in the out years. But again, we haven't finalized raises with our bargaining units. So um, that will, will change ultimately once we have those, that information. With that, any questions? My question is, I guess, not really related to this budget, more like with second interim, will we have any idea about how much we'll get from like Prop 28 having passed? Will that start kicking in in 23, 24? I don't know. Yeah. I would say I'm waiting for the governor's budget proposal in January, <clears throat> which I'm hoping to get more detail on. We're also waiting to hear about mental health funding because there's been lots of conversation about that. I don't have any new information on that either. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. A lot of work, yeah. Appreciate that. All right. Oh, 
Matthew? I just want to know that. Um, just want to know Ellen Webster is in the, um, is on Zoom. Oh, So I just okay. want to, I, we're trying to promote her up to oh, okay. Alice so we yeah, can see I, if she has any she, questions. I click promote and, and it, her, she has not moved over. I'm not sure if it's something on her end that she has to click okay. I just mm -hmm. chatted her to see if she's okay there, but I haven't gotten her something back yet. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chris. Okay, moving on to report on activities and correspondence of school board members. It's been a full month since our last board meeting, so there were a lot. Um, office hours, Pengrove, McDowell, Casa, McKinley Packs, Valley Vista, McNear, Petaluma Junior, Petaluma High, Kenilworth, Adult Ed, and Family Resource Center. Also visits to the Petaluma High government classes, website review, CSBA annual conference, budget advisory committee, safety committee, art and music plan development, Wildlife Museum Fundraiser, Continuous Improvement Committee, Equity Committee, Delegate Assembly of CSBA, San Antonio High School Teachers Masters Presentation Support, Safe Routes to School Meeting, AAPI Coalition of the North Bay, Community Gathering, PHS Recycling Club, Visit from PEF to Receive a Grant for Trojan Broadcast, that was Mia, PEF Grant Presentation at CASA for Costa Grande's Tree Planting, that was Alan. City of Petaluma's Climate Action Commission meeting, Health Sciences Club, Childhood Cancer Relief Club. Right. So yeah. that's it. <laughs> wow. um, did anyone have anything they wanted to share from any of their activities? Sure. Uh, I just want to say a word about the delegate assembly. So the California School Boards Association is the association of all the California school boards, about 5,000 members. Um, I and uh, the the subset of them is uh, the delegate assembly, and I've been on it for the last six months and uh, learned quite a bit. Uh, for one thing, uh, the school boards association is the largest association of elected officials in the country, and as such, we there's a lot of political sway uh, in in that group. And so, the delegate assembly is the subset of those members who establish the advocacy um agenda for the association and so i raise that uh, because um uh, i want to hear from our community you know what are the things that we should be putting the weight of the school boards association on particularly the state legislature and the federal congress um regarding the schools and you know right now uh, we just met at the at the, at the conference uh, in san diego and um, there's kind of three big bucket, big buckets that we're looking at at state uh, advocacy uh, on equity, state stability and funding. And uh, the third was um, facilities, facilities. So it, in those categories, particularly, if anyone has any comments or ideas, please uh, send them my way and I'll take them to the School Boards Association. Thank you. Maddie, did you have something? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment on the safe routes to school meeting. It was an, our inaugural meeting um, and it was with um, Petaluma City School officials, city council, um, community advocates. Um, did I already say Petaluma City? So we actually met with the city and, um, and then, you know, bike and ped, we had, um, county representation so um it's it was just the first meeting kind of getting to know each other what um what was on people's minds and i just wanted to kind of mention it to everybody because it, it really seems like a very positive movement matthew did a great job um i think it's going to be taken over at least in this, the next meeting will be through the city bjorn and i can't pronounce but anyway um, it was, um, everybody really felt very positive about it and they felt like there was going to be movement on making our streets safer and in particular looking at our schools and how it impacts the whole community. So actually having schools in that conversation <laughs> um, is really, really important. So I just wanted to let you guys know. It was great. Yeah, thank you. 
Caitlin or um, not Alan, Julian. Um, yeah, I went to also at CSBA a um, couple of really great sessions, but one was focusing in on ethnic studies. I know last meeting we had the presentation about ethnic studies, and it was a panel of AAPI board members and superintendents, and just really um, just you know, imploring all of us not to like kind of step away from the focus on AAPI hate and hate crimes. Um, they are the, one of the most bullied groups, especially now, you know, over the last year or two. Um, so yeah, it's just a good reminder and just what ethnic studies can do to really build empathy and compassion in students. So, all right. So, Let me, oh, I know it's a, <clears throat> A little atypical, but um, I just wanted to chime in here as well for reports and activities and correspondence of school board members. Um, I had the great pleasure of, of going down to California School Board Association meeting in San Diego with four of our of our trustees, and I just wanted to. I know it's been in the newspaper and it's been all over social media, but I just wanted to you know hear while we're all together on behalf of everybody um, congratulate our president Joanna Pon on receiving the. California School Board Association's School Board Member of, of the Year. Um, there are approximately, approximately 1,000 school districts in, in California, approximately 5,000 school board members. And when Joanna uh, went up on stage and received the award, I was, I mean, I think all of us were brought to tears. Her, the way that you, um, talked about your your childhood and the way that education impacted you, the way that you represented our community of Petaluma and really got us on um, got us on the map <laughs> at, at CSBA. It was just um, it it was really, really an incredible sort of out of body experience for I think all of us and sitting in the front row cheering you on, hearing Petaluma up on the big stage with thousands of people in attendance was um, I just, just congratulations and, and thank you to Caitlin who started the process and, and nominated, nominated you, Joanna. And um, we're, we're all, we were all behind you and just really excited, excited for you. So congratulations. We got little... so pretty believe it or not i'm actually very shy and so like <laughs> this is just as nerve-wracking for me as being up on that stage with all you guys watching but and i did mention this in the speech but honestly i feel like you guys should have all been up there with me including our student board members like every decision we make is all of us and maite and chris and jason and tony like we could not do any of the work if you guys did not put so much time and effort into everything and our teachers and classified staff just, I don't really feel like I deserve the award. It really is shared with the whole district. So, <laughs> but I am definitely appreciate it still sinking in. So thank you. All right, moving on. <laughs> approval of consent agenda by consolidated motion. I'll move to approve. Second. All right, any questions or comments? I have a couple. Sorry. <laughs> Do not apologize yeah. for asking questions. Jo Joanne, did we? I think we skipped over oh, com skip? comments from the public. Oh, I always, I always skip something. Okay. okay. Sorry. Um, comments from the public on consent items. I already read the board policy, so I won't go back through that. Um, we'll open the chat for a few minutes. And if you have a comment, either online or in person, if you're in person, please come up to the front. And if you are online, please put your first and last name in the chat and the subject that you would like to speak about. I can't see, I forgot my glasses in the car, so I can't tell if there's anything in there. No, no. 
No, we we do have two comment cards, but they're okay. under under discussion. Okay. Discussion items. We'll leave it open for a little bit. Okay, we will close the chat. Now we will move on to approval of consent agenda by consolidated motion. We already have motion and a second. So Maddie, go ahead. Um, I just had a real quick clarification question about the marimba, um, the two new, uh, whatever they were, the agreements. Um, are they two new ones? No. So the so it's just the one about. Um, so we brought to you the agreement last time, right? And unfortunately, we did not attach the rental agreement. Okay, so that's the only part that's new. Yes, the other one, but they kind of go hand in hand. So one, so we brought them both together. Okay. Even though you've already approved the one, so it's it's only the addition of the rental agreement. Perfect. And it's rental of equipment. Yeah, the Rembrandt equipment. Exactly. So that actually you kind of have, so to have something to play. You have to have something to play with in the Marimba. Yeah, so just, yeah, you know. Right. Um, and then the only other thing um, am I on the employment report, there was a position um, under a um, management position. And I just it just I just want to be clear that this is a temporary position um and the and it's to coach new principals yes right? yes yeah, so we have 14 new site administrators this year and seven of them are actually site principals so of those seven we um are we had to we wanted to find mentors for each of them in addition to the support they get from the district office so that position is um is on a, P, a professional expert agreement and it's approximately an hour and a half per month per person that's being mentored. And that individual is listed at for two schools because they're mentoring two elementary principals. So similar to new teachers going through, formerly known as BITSA, uh, new teacher induction, how you typically have a mentor, our new site principals, we have given all seven of them a um, an outside mentor who they can just bounce ideas off and talk and have a safe space that not, is non-evaluative. That's what it is. And, and this has been done before? Yes. I had one myself. Great. <laughs> first year, typically for the first year. First year, yeah. You yeah. just don't usually have so many. Right. But I think I think the uh, many of the others mm -hmm. went through on probably earlier employment reports. Yes. So uh, you may, may not have recognized the names. Uh, but but we have we have a number of, of people that are on these supporting our principals this year yeah. and in years past. Thank you. Thank you. Um, more of a comment. Again, super excited about the Sonoma State MOU. Um, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for our students, especially you know. Again, we talk about break. Um, breaking barriers and not having, you know, I just paid 70 bucks for my kid to get in there. I guess <laughs> the next one can just get in for free. So um, yeah, that's really exciting. But then I also had- The fifth grader. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right, two more, Jasmine and then okay. Jalen, yeah. So, I just lose track of all the kids that I have, <laughs> as I'm sure you do too. Always counting, counting to four all the time. Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, and then, I don't know if I have a question or a comment about all the field trips. They just seem expensive. $800 a person for the cheer, $284 for the McNear camp, $238 for the gold rush. And I know that there are parent donations. And I know we've talked about this before. I don't, definitely I'm going to uh, vote to approve them, but just again, highlighting like all of these costs that we keep talking about. All, me and Maite had a great discussion last week mm -hmm. about the costs of things and um, just making sure that, you know, that the full team knows if you can't pay, like, you know, hopefully there's some, you know, help available. Same. I know that the schools do that too, but just once again, just wanted to highlight that. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, Joanne. And, and I, you know, 
we have talked with our, our principals and we will continue to talk about if, if there's a student who, I mean, not something I'm very passionate about and I've always been, if there's a student who cannot afford to go or, or it's causing a barrier to being able to go on a field trip, we have their scholarships available. We, we have to plan for that. So it's not, if you can't pay, you can't go on a field trip mm -hmm. that we can't, we can't stand, we can't stand for that. So just tagging on that though, uh, you might say we, we just had our equity meeting and we were talking about specifically this, uh, an example of this, or this is an example of that topic, which was how, when, what kind of opportunities are, do we have in our schools that require a parent or a student forking over money and, you know, to what extent can, you know, uh, our students aware that they right. you know there are opportunities to get scholarships if there are indeed anyway that's that's the whole this is a great example of what we we're talking about on friday or whenever it was of of i think something that we need to audit in our school district to see mm -hmm. you know where are those uh, barriers to to participation good point anything else caitlin Julian, no? Okay. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, comments from the public on action items. We will reopen the chat for about a minute. If you have a comment on the action item, sorry, any of the action items, please put your first and last name in the chat or come up to the front. He made it bigger. Chat box. I can see it now. I won't see it anymore. Okay, we can close the chat. And is there any, no? Yes, no? Okay. All right. First one, AB361. Has this one changed yet? No? Is it expiring soon? It changes oh. in February. Okay. Yeah. All right, Caitlin, take away. <laughs> I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, approval to the change in the calendar for, is this the year round? Or the, or both? Okay. Jason or Matthew, do you want to talk about this one? Sure. So um, this first resolution is uh, a resolution to move admissions day, which is typically September 9th to um to observe it on wednesday november 22nd some we do consistently to have holidays during that thanksgiving break i move to approve second all in favor aye, aye. aye. okay um next one so this is this is um a similar resolution to move uh Lincoln's holiday, which is uh, of February 12th, 2024, and to observe it on February 20th, which is a Tuesday, 2024. Mm -hmm. So that would work with the new calendar that we've developed for the next school year. Move to approve resolution 2223-10. All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Next up, um, no, we can new attendance calendars. I'd like to hear have, just a little bit about the process. Yeah. Yeah. I have some questions about it too. So, the process first? Sure. Um, or, or do you want to ask questions first? 
process first. Process first, okay. Right. So um, our calendar process is lined out in contract that we, and I try to include some of that in this description of who is on that committee. So you see that we have um, some members from PFT, some members from CSEA, uh, one confidential employee, um, one representative from a feeder district, and then some administration representing as well. Uh, we worked, it's a similar group that worked last year to develop the calendar for this year. And last year we had started developing the calendar that we have now, but we came back this year and revisited it and made some more changes to it. Uh, both of those two calendars, when we started this process last year, we had a pretty, um, I, I think a larger than normal feedback process where we were, we were first started by uh, sending out a survey to our families and our staff to ask them questions about how they felt about calendar before we even started. And then we went back after we started working and we sent a second round of, of information to ask them specific questions about some of the things we were considering. And so we tried to incorporate all of that feedback as much as we can, because we got often conflicting feedback and there's no perfect calendar, but um, we tried to, as a committee, be really thoughtful and, and uh, incorporate as much of that feedback as possible so that we could have a calendar that met all of the competing interests that we have. You know, we were balancing one of the big things that we have to balance is um, is the need in secondary between first and second semesters to be as as close together as possible in terms of number of days because of the importance of having that. And it's really hard to do. And you can see we aren't there. We are as close as we could be. But there were a lot of competing factors like that and balancing the needs of the year rounds and meshing that with the traditional. So we also have, don't have wildly different calendars but that they that they start to sync up after after we go through fall break so there were a lot of uh, a lot of interest that we were trying to balance and we were trying to incorporate all the feedback that we had from our staff and our families and um, I think that this calendar represents us working on it last year and then coming back and working on it again this year I think we had what maybe three I know we have a couple of members here we had maybe four meetings this year was it three or four four-ish, probably four-ish meetings um, to get there, but um, we felt it, it was pretty, a lot of consensus in the committee about the calendar that we had. And Matt, you had a question. And I, I'm just, I'll just add, we, oh. we also had a, I don't know if you mentioned this or not, Jason, but a, um, one of our, fe another feeder district, WA was also, also participated because we try to sync up the, the calendars as much as possible, at least within Petaluma love to sync up with some Santa Rosa. We know we have some staff members who have, yeah. who live up in Santa Rosa. So just trying as much as we can, it's never perfect. I'll say one of the big pieces of feedback we received is that um, the, the week of spring break, the week after when we did the power shutdowns, why are we still doing power shutdowns? We didn't have, we haven't used them in two years. Well, we just did, we just used two power shutdown days this year um, over at Casa Grande. So, so in, in we, but we did reduce down from five to. We, we reduced down from five to three. Five and to three. we also moved where that, where that break was. And you saw we threw it into February to have some more um, breaks within the schedule. It also helps with our, um, we have our intercessions. So yeah. we were looking at the, that the ability to provide those intercession blocks for families that were ready to take advantage of that. Um, so, so with I, the EL, ELOP funding right now, re the requirement to using at least 40 at 40 days include so summer school and these intercessions. So we thought, you know, this midwinter break, we can now offer an intercession. So families who say, you know, oh my gosh, now there's a, another break in February. Well, we're gonna offer intercession for students to be able to go in, have an, at least a nine hour day at the school sites, working with our partners. And so that it's, there's, there's some continuation of services for families who want that or need that. If we don't use those three days. If we don't, exactly. If yes. we don't have a power shutdown, yes. <laughs> yeah, and then we have to reassess, but we, yeah. Yeah. And you had a question, Maddie? Oh, I just, you know, I, it's, it's in the, it, it's just a clarification. Mm -hmm. It's in the, the black section um, where uh, it says February 21st to 23rd are designated as emergency makeup days. Yeah. 
if we have an emergency closure during the year, this week will be used yes. for any missed days. Mm -hmm. If we do not have an emergency school closure during the year, this week will be an extension of the spring break. Oh, um, no. A decision whether days need to be made up or not will be announced no later than the first week of March. I think that was just holdover. Like, it was, was just was from the old over, one, right? That so, was holdover that that, that should okay. be adjusted. Okay, that should I just, be adjusted. Thank you. Thank and you I, for pointing that out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just. <laughs> I do think it's no. important, and you read it in the notes. These are not power shutoff days. Emergency. They're emergency closure days, emergency. and that could be because of flood. It could yep. be because of. Originally, they were the PSPS, the power. You know, the this PG&E shutting off power because of fire danger, but. From the state's perspective, their emergency closure day is much like snow days. So it could be for any reason. Ironically, with CASA, it's literally oh. a power shut off. <laughs> yeah. But, okay, thank you. Yeah, so that was a holdover from when they were paired with that's spring what break. I, that's yes. what I assumed, but I don't think we want that on there. No, we don't. No, we don't. We'll edit that. I'm glad it wasn't me. Yeah. I didn't notice that. I move to approve with Maddie's amendments. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, approval of the budget revision. Unless anyone wants a further presentation, I move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, resolution 2223-11. Do you want to talk about this? Oh, yeah, another riveting presentation mm -hmm. on developer fees. And so we collect developer fees um, for both the high school district and the elementary district. We're obligated to report on the collection of those developer fees within 180 days of the close of the fiscal year. We bring it in December and we're basically reporting on how, what was our beginning balance? What was our ending balance? How much did we collect? What are the total fees we charge? Were there any refunds? There was only one refund in one district. What are we planning or intending to use the funds for? And so we have listed that in the report. Primarily, we're looking at doing things like building a new um, expanded building at Pengrove, building a new expanded kinder slash TK building at, Ken at um, McKinley. I've also added in that purchasing the portables at Cherry Valley because three of those five portables at Cherry Valley we do not own. And they're in disrepair and the cost to repair them for the company versus our carpenters doing them in house is almost the cost of starting to purchase them. So I'm going to be looking at bringing back a purchase price to start. We've been paying $6,000 of rent. I don't know how long those portals have been there, mm -hmm. but um, they've paid for themselves probably twice over at this point. So I'd like to look into possibly purchasing them because I don't think they're going anywhere where anytime soon. So I added that in the developer fee. And those portables were added for growth at the time. So it's an appropriate nexus to be able to actually fund them. And then any questions, essentially in a nutshell. I move to approve. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, interesting approval of contract with cdph testing service my tag so we so we just <laughs> we just shared with everyone how we're closing down the COVID testing center and then we got an offer we couldn't refuse um <laughs> cdph contacted us and other school districts um and offered free testers through a contract agency called Health IT. And um, considering the surge that we are in and predicted to go higher, it was not something that we could refuse. So we are reopening the COVID testing center with um, contract labor um, at no cost to us. So, so all we had to do we was will have, We will have three, three, three staff people. members in the COVID, in the, in the COVID area, 100% fully funded by California Department of Public Health, and so really they're, they're employees of California Department of Public Health, but they'll be working here for Penelman City Schools 
testing, helping coordinate. It'll be professional rapid at antigen and we'll, well, the PCR program is not funded and not in existence, but they'll be able to do professionally administered. They'll be able to do overnight field trips prior to departure, outbreaks, um, all the things that we would have our COVID team, our former COVID team doing so they can continue to work the other jobs and helping oversee that work. But um, it's, we're lucky to be able to be able to bring it back considering the situation that we're finding ourselves in. Is this starting right away? Um, they will start training um, in the, in this week and next week, and they'll be open and full first, full service when we get back from the break. So it's full time. Yes, full time, seven thirty to five p, seven thirty to four p.m. every day through the remainder of the school year. Is it just for PCS families and students, or is it for the community? Since it's, it's family mm -hmm. and students and staff. So, okay. Yeah. It's not. It's not a community test. Okay. Like it's, I don't want to say schools, students, families. Extended it's not, families. It's not a community. It's not a community site. It's a. It's for our school district. Okay. Families. People live under there under the same roof, right? And they'll be mobile as well. They'll be going to school sites too. Did they reach out to us because we closed ours? <laughs> I'm like, is that all we had to do to get the, the help? Yeah, it was the timing was really very funny. But about mm -hmm. the time I finished speaking, there was an email okay. um, letting us know that it was available. So I had I had uh, sent they've asked several months ago and I expressed some interest and then oh, okay. several months later they came back with the offer. I move to approve free services. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep forgetting to ask you, Julian if you have any questions or comments about anything. This? Okay, all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All Thank right. You. Thank you. Approval of the parent circles. So in the um, in October we ha held a parent circle. Erin, mm -hmm. who's a parent in PCS schools, is a professional facilitator of circles, and he held one for us. And we had about twenty parents participate, and it was very very well received. Mm -hmm. Parents were very excited about it and wanted more. So Erin and I met, and we are targeting sixth and ninth grade parents, which are those kind of critical transition years. Um, and we will hold a series of circles. And we're also looking at affinity groups, perhaps mm -hmm. EL parents, newcomers, um, LGBTQI plus community mm -hmm. to be able to provide a space for them. Um, it's really about providing support for each other and leaning on your community. So we're giving it a try this year mm -hmm. and um, Aaron's a great resource to us. Yeah. And it goes right into like what we've been talking about with the Healthy Choices Committee. like families just needing a place to like bend and like get help and resources. So this is great. Any questions or comments about this one? Yeah, sounds great. I move to approve. Oh, All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, comments from the public on discussion and information items. It's like we have two in person and we will open the chat. So if anyone online has um, any questions or comments about any of our discussion items, please put your first and last name in the chat. And while the chat is open, we will invite our two in-person speakers up. Christy Holquist. Good evening. I'm Christy Holquist, a TK teacher at Valley Vista. This is my 11th year in teaching at Valley Vista, but my 28th in my teaching career. And my own children graduate from Petaluma High and Carpe. I'm not big on public speaking, but when there's a need to speak for the best interest of my students, I will. I love teaching transitional kindergarten. My class consists of 18 four and five-year-olds two that fall into the kindergarten age that parents requested to attend TK, five speech and language students, two that receive OT, one that gets PT, 
three multilingual students two, and two more that received early intervention mm -hmm. services prior to their entering um, TK. At Valley Vista, due to enrollment, my youngest will not turn five until May 28th. So you can see my hands are full, but so is my heart. I thank the, dis I thank the district for providing a full-time aid to the TK teachers this year. It's been invaluable. I recently had some guests from Sonoma State University. They came in for my morning work time and one told me, you make it all look so easy. So I've been thinking about that statement. Um, and I think we all try to make it easy because no one, no one teacher wants to see, um, see how exhausting it really can be. As a TK teacher, I'm on 100%. As soon as that first child comes in the gate and I'm not off until the last one leaves. And then the commitments of planning, prepping, communication and documentation begin. It's more than a full-time job most days. And then many of us come home to our own families to take care of and love them. I see that tonight there'll be a first reading of language around the opening and the enrollment dates for TK. It's a wonderful feeling to be able to provide free and appropriate education for our youngest learners. Examining the long language proposed, I noticed that a ratio of 12 to one is being used. However, if you take a look at the document attached onto the websites, TK California directs you to cd.gov, where you can go under the category of program for information, question number 15, uh, what are the adult to child ratio? Quote, starting in school year 2022-23, adult to child ratios for TK classrooms are one adult to 12, 12 children, contingent on additional funding appropriated by the legislature, this ratio may reduce to one to 10 starting in school year 2023-24, set forth in educational code section 48000. I believe that a ratio of one to 10 in PCS TK classes is what's best for kids. I would appreciate it if when opening the window for TK, we also go with a recommendation ratio of 10 to one. Please consider what is the best for our youngest learners. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next up is Freya Sharp. Hi, I'm Freya Sharp. I teach TK at McNear. I've been teaching the little ones there for 21 years now. Um, and I agree with everything that Christy has said. So I don't want to reiterate anything or restate. But really, TK is a foundational year. Um, we're teaching the littlest students to be independent, to be confident learners, and then thoughtful members of our community as well. Um, because the state has said, you know, 10 to 1 eventually, once the date backs up, we really feel as TK team that if we're backing the date off, we need to try to get to that ratio as soon as we can as well with all of those little guys. Um, I also have a letter from a colleague who is not able to speak tonight. So I'm gonna read that too. My name is Lara O'Brien and I'm the TK teacher at Cherry Valley Elementary School. I have over 25 years of experience teaching three to six year olds in both private and public schools. I'm extremely passionate about early childhood education, and I feel that it's long overdue to have focus put on our young learners and the professionals that teach them. I hold a multiple subject teaching credential, an ECE site supervisor credential, and American Montessori Society ages three to six teaching credential. I believe that my experience in education make my opinion one that needs to be heard. I'm surrounded by fellow TK teachers here in the Petaluma City School District that combined give us over 100 years of experience and expertise. I believe that all four-year-olds deserve the opportunity to attend TK for free and get a solid foundation in a classroom setting. I was thrilled to see UTK become a reality and I'm proud to be a part of that. What I'm struggling with is the fact that while all the evidence shows that a smaller class size of 10 to one is necessary, to provide our young learners with the nurturing environment they need to be successful in school, to feel safe, to feel heard, to have their needs met as a whole child, socially, emotionally, physically, and academically. We still continue to push that ratio to the back of our priorities. While we are considering admitting young learners who turn four by May, 
we may need to critically think about what a child needs at that young of an age. While in older classrooms, a time span of one year does not make as much of an impact, it can be significant in a TK classroom. If you have a class where a group of children turn four in May and a group of children turn five four months later in September, there's a significant difference in the way we approach those learners to meet their needs. I'm a big advocate for mixed-aged classrooms, and in order to offer a developmentally appropriate curriculum to these young learners, we require a ratio of 10 to 1. A class of 24 versus a class of 20 is a big difference when teaching in early childhood education, most importantly when there are children with special needs that need extra love and attention. I chose to teach in my hometown for Petaluma City Schools because I felt that my core values were aligned with the district. I believe that all students have value, infinite potential, and the right to an excellent education. Let's show that those values reflect even on the youngest learners in our schools and follow the universal TK guidelines to do what we all know is the right thing to do for the children. Make the ratio 10 to one. Thank you for your time and all that you do for our community of students, educators, and parents. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, this doesn't look like there's anyone online who has a public comment. Is there anyone else in person that has a comment about any of these items? No? Okay, all right. So the next item is the first reading of the new course proposal, AP Drawing at CASA. Did I skip something? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so AP, um... Casa Grande wants to bring uh, forward the opportunity to offer AP drawing. Um, so as we find ways to continue to challenge our students and um, provide them with not only opportunity to be challenged, but also college credit, uh, AP drawing is something that um, I think also aligns with, you know, how we want to expand the arts for our students and uh, provide them that opportunity as well. So I think it's a, a course that um, will be probably pretty popular. Um, and also give the students just a better opportunity to, to take more AP courses and, um, and give them the opportunity to, to get more credits for college or, and be challenged. Cool, any questions or comments? More art, I'm sure you like that. Maddie, I'm sorry, it's pointing, it's gesturing towards oh, you. Art, art, <laughs> art to me. I'm thrilled. I think it's great. It's, I'm glad that it's drawing. Yeah, and they get to really build. Yeah, and they get to build portfolios of their work and research, as opposed to maybe taking a multiple choice test. That you know, mm -hmm. it's a different way of kind of assessing the students, and really brings out the creativity as well as some um, you know deeper understanding of what they actually have no, learned and know in the art. All right, next one, another new course proposal at Casa: Child Development and Careers in Education. Yeah, as we uh, you know look to how we continue to build our, our teacher pipeline. Um, and I know the conversations around, you know, potentially building a, a career technical pathway for education, this will be the start of that um, by providing child development and career, in career education and allowing students to have that introductory course to begin exploring uh, fields in education. Um, and it is a CTE, CTE course that will be CTE uh, funded as well as uh, meeting uh, A through G. Just one, one thing, it are, um, I'm assuming that the um, internships and job shadows would come in the second year, um, so, but I was wondering if, if part of it was gonna be building relationships um, through this class for the next, you know, so that they can start getting, maybe just job shadows, that kind of thing. Um, is that built or is that just something you- Yeah, I think the more, line? yeah, the, the job shadowing and, uh, um, I think right now it's around the theory uh, uh, of, uh, of um, oh, you know, working with students and, um, you know, learning to write lesson plans and quizzes and things like that that teachers would do. And then the concentrator course and the capstone would lead into more of that job shadowing. And um, not to say that they may maybe have an opportunity to do some of that uh, during the intro introductory course, but that will most likely happen later in the concentration and the capstone courses. Questions or comments about this one? Yeah. All right. Um, first reading board policy about the TK. 
Um, so uh, a part of this board policy is an, um, an update um, in regards to uh, when students start transition to kindergarten. I think we're getting ahead of that. Um, uh, and I know maybe Matthew or Mike may be able to speak to it a little bit more, um, more deeply than, than I know, but um, I think that's something that we want to bring forward to be up to date with uh, some of the new policies that are in place. So, and Maite, feel feel free to jump in. But so the TK the TK dates these that you see here towards the beginning of the policy, um, we really kind of backed it up. It, we I think the last policy just spoke to twenty one twenty two, and we said who, um, children whose fifth birthday is between September second through January fifteenth. We a lot of, so then as you go on, you can see that it's just continuing to increase until you get to number five for the 25, 26 school year. And in each school year thereafter, children who turn four by September 1st are eligible for TK. Mm -hmm. We're not making up these dates. These are these are in education code 4,800 or 48,000. Um, the date here, we're typically about one month ahead of the um, one more one month more generous than um, that is in state state law. Um, we do that partially. We've got you know some of our surrounding uh, feeder districts mm -hmm. are even more generous as far as accepting younger students, and so it's it's you know making sure that we're we're um, accessible to as many of our families as possible. But that last one for the 25-26 school year, children who turn four by September first, that is just state law. So all the way up there up until then. You know, number four through June, June second. I think the date may be uh, May. I, I'm not sure exactly what it is. We're we're about one month ahead of what the state requires us to be. Um, when you get down to um, Matthew, I think we're only we're only one month ahead next year. Okay. The following year, I think we then catch up and we're back on track. I thought we were about a month ahead for everyone except for the last one. We're two uh, months ahead right now. Yep. The law right now is February. February 2nd, we're at April 2nd. So then I think the next one would have been April 2nd next yeah, year. And we're May 2nd. Right, so we're month, one month ahead next year. Yep. But then I think it jumped to June 2nd and then September. So I think, have, yeah, in a year, I think we're caught up. Yeah. So I just wanna keep, um, keep going down here. Then we talk about um, towards the bottom. And again, feel free to jump in anybody. <laughs> We said the district shall commencing with the 22-23 school year, maintain an average of at least one adult for every 12 students for TK classrooms. And what that means is if you have a classroom of more than 12, you have two adults in the classroom. So we have full-time instructional assistants in all of our TK classrooms. For TK classrooms, and will maintain appropriate adult to student ratio in accordance with California education code. It is absolutely true. The, the governor has, um, Express there will be funding to move this to 10 to one. Um, and we well, have- Well, I think he expressed there may be there, funding. There may be funding to move it to 10 to one. Starting with next year, we, if, and that's why we kind of added in there in accordance with California education code, we're, we're anticipating that, that we were, that may have been a reality this year. It wasn't, it was 12 to one this year. Mm -hmm. As they move the dates further and further out, that means you're getting younger and younger yeah. students in the program. And so the state, we're, we're kind of, we're mirroring, mirroring what the state is funding allocates for us. And so at a certain point, he's talked a lot about 10 to one. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen the funding yet. So Chris, I'll let you. No, it's true. And in fact, last spring in the May revise, there was a question about whether it was gonna go to 10 to one even for this year. There was a big question. There was some idea that in the state adopted budget, but it ended up staying at the 12 to one. Right. And so I think we'll have a better idea once we hit January about what his budget proposal will be for next year. I would anticipate there's a good probability he'll put 10 to one in the budget proposal, but it'll be interesting to see if by the time they get to the May revise, if it stays in or not. We're gonna have to be looking at a 10 to one anyway, just kind of preparing from a capacity perspective because some of our schools are already using all of their classrooms and so, if you think about a school like Grant, they're currently at 23 to one or 23 in a TK classroom now. If we had to add a second TK, TK classroom, you know, we're gonna have to really scramble to try to find facilities at some of our schools. So we're already gonna, we've already been talking about and looking at 
what do we do if that becomes a reality? So I would say that from a planning perspective, we're already looking at if it's 10 to one, how do we make that work? And as and the dates get further and further out, it's more and more, there's more and more pressure on. Well, and my, my grandson is in um, her TK class at Valley Vista and she is a phenomenal teacher and does an amazing job and so grateful for the work that she does. And it's true, having the littler ones is definitely much more of a challenge, mm -hmm. there's no doubt. So, um, so anyway, I think from a planning perspective, we're already looking at that as a real possibility, if not a probability. And I just want to, so which is why that that language is in there. We'll maintain appropriate adult student ratio in accordance with California education code. It's not to say we're as soon as, soon as the funding, as soon as the government comes out and says, okay, now it's we're funding you at 10 to 1, it becomes 10 to 1. Um, if you know, if you want to be more restrictive and say, uh, we as a district, we're gonna we're requiring it to be ten to one. That can be a conversation, but I'm anticipating that he, it's been a topic of conversation for over a year. He's been talking and talking and talking about ten to one for TK. So, uh, I'm connecting some dots here, um, Chris. So um, on the dartboard or for interim one. Uh, and in in the enrollment projections, do those projections include TK or not? They actually do. We're assuming another class okay. of about twenty four students, and by class, it doesn't mean one class. It could be, you know, a, a class of. Uh, so we're assuming about another twenty four students in both of the next two years. And but on the um, dartboard, I don't see a. Is TK in the K-5 column? That's not funded in the same rates as K-5. It is actually. It's it funded is. in the TK to 3, in the K-3. However, they're giving well, us an yeah. additional amount of about 2813. So on the LCFF calculations, for example, we now have to put in what our TK ADA is okay. or projected TK ADA is for the out years. And then they factor in an additional $2,813 per ADA in order to pay for that additional, and it's a six hour instructional assistant. So full-time means they're there for the entire class day. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's a different augmentation, grade span adjustment, whatever they're gonna call it for TK, but the base funding is the same as kinder. TK is essentially, I mean, they consider it a, it's a two year kindergarten experience. Right. Right. So it's really Even in CBEDS, when you look up enrollment online, it doesn't differentiate TK. It, all, the, all of the numbers fall under kinder. But since the TK uh, ratios are essentially half of kindergarten, doesn't that double the per pupil uh, um, allocation? Supposedly. <laughs> I, all I can tell you is they're not giving us okay. full additional funding. They're, they're giving us 2,800 bucks a, per ADA more too. But it also, if you think about it, it's really not double because we're not paying for two teachers. We're paying for a teacher and an instructional assistant. Okay. So it's two adults. It's not necessarily two full-time teachers. Okay. So um, it'll be interesting to see if, if they do implement the 10 to one, if they increase that rate mm -hmm. um, from 2813, not just by the COLA, but to an amount that's higher to accomplish that. And my guess is they will. And that's why it's May because it's all contingent on funding. They know that they have to put more funding in if they're gonna shrink the ratio. So we did not factor that into our calculations yet because we don't know what that'll look like. Any other questions, comments? All right. Um, Tony, it's you again. Uh, yeah, so the next uh, re the next three are just um, okay. revised administrative regulations that we had uh, put in first reading at the last school meeting. So we're just updating. Oh, okay. All right. Does anyone have any questions about any of these? Identification under Section 504, Education for Foster Youth, or IEP program. Sorry, IE, IEPs. Okay. No. All right, moving on to future business. Anything for future business. Julian, do you have anything that you would like to see discussed in an upcoming board meeting? Well, I guess 
for board meetings, not necessarily, but there's just like one issue, I guess, that's been going on for a little while. Okay. Uh, but it's just like bathroom policies because I feel like some teachers and principals and everything, like the principal will say one thing and then the teacher will do another thing and won't really follow that. And I think it should just kind of be a simple thing because, you know, it's a bathroom. Right. Um, and like, or like sometimes with other things with kids going in as well, like obviously I feel like there should be some not rule or something, but mm -hmm. just someone that's keeping an eye out. Cause obviously if you see like 10 people walking into a bathroom all at the same time, I, know, yeah. I don't necessarily <laughs> think they're all going to use the bathroom at the exact same time, you know, the way it's intended to use. Um, um, Cause I know some kids, <laughs> you know, they actually want to use it, but then they see 10 other kids mm -hmm. walk in and they're all like, uh, never mind, you know, and they try walking around, or whatever. Because I used to be like that, <laughs> but because I talked with uh, Dan Osterman about it as well, I was like, "What's your guys' bathroom policies?" Because some teachers are just completely eliminating it um, for any students to go. So it's like some kids, you know, guys or girls, especially, you know, if they have to go, they have to go. Mm -hmm. It's so it's kind of unfair for teachers, like, no, you know. Um, and then also how my mom was saying she doesn't really like the fact how some teachers will do the whole like credit extra credit thing for bathrooms like oh. where it's like oh if you don't go you know you get 10 extra credit points like ooh, you know really? <laughs> it's been a thing for a long time and like yeah, i just I'm, when i was thinking about it i was like i'm sure there's like a lot of other ways to have <laughs> students get extra credit points because like driver. you ask i don't know how many students they're probably all going to say that they have at least experienced one teacher in their lifetime that's done that i have experienced multiple i know my girlfriend has experienced multiple my brother has also experienced multiple my older sister who's graduated experienced that so it's like it, it's kind of forcing kids to like not go to the bathroom when they have to or something you know and obviously if you have to go, but like you can't for whatever reason, you know, it can cause some like health issues and uh, which is what my little brother got. So obviously it, it kind of shows, it's showing itself that it's not really, you know, it needs to be, I feel like it should be a set you want, policy. You would like to see some consistency in that? Yeah. And have it like maybe express more clearly to students? Is that what you're asking for? Yeah, both to the students and teachers. Uh, Cause obviously, you know, I'm sure the principals, they know. But like when it comes down to the teachers and then the students, it's kind of just, oh, you know, they said this, but oh, they said that, you know, and so on. So thank that. you. Maybe this is something you and Matthew can talk about and kind of work on, like the best way to approach this. Again, so great to have student board members because that would have never made my list to future business. So thank you. And I also thank you. Thank you for that, Julian. I'd, I'd love to. Uh, to talk more about bathroom policy. I also just want to just congratulate you. You're graduating in when? A few days. Next week. So Next week. Okay. Wow. And um, so my understanding, you're going to continue on with the board through the end of the year. Yeah. Fantastic. Be like an alum. And then you're going to walk in, in June, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Walk in June. Okay. Of course. And so. it's the riveting budget. Yeah, that's what <laughs> keeps them. Yeah. Good. Well, congratulations, yeah, congratulations, congratulations, Julian, yeah, and yeah. Um, we Thank will you. we look forward to having you continue on in, in, in the board for the rest of the year, and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be clapping for you as you cross the in in June. So, Thank you. Awesome. Anything else? Anyone else have anything? I know can't beat the bathroom policies. All right. With that, we are adjourned. Well, see you in 2023. <clears throat> That's right.